Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 1 p.m. session of the November 23rd, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you're attending this meeting virtually and wish to comment on an item, agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a streaming a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins is absent. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Councilmember Golder is currently absent. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Present. Okay. First off, <clears throat> excuse me. First item is a mayoral proclamation declaring Saturday, November 27th, 2021 as Small Business Saturday Day. And Bonnie, I believe you have the proclamation. That's what Suzanne told me. Do you have that? Did I put, is it in the drawer? She said she was gonna leave it with you. Take it with me, and then she said she would leave it to you. Okay. Mayor, I can uh, put it up on screen share if you would like. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. That would be great, Bonnie. Thank you. Actually. Just a second. Okay. Do you need screen sharing <coughs> ability, Bonnie? Yeah. Sorry, I'm having trouble finding it. I had it a few minutes ago. Let's see. Here it is. Okay. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. So this is uh, for the public. We're on item number four, which is a mayoral proclamation declaring Saturday, November 27th, 2021 as Small Business Saturday day sorry <laughs> that's perfect thank you bonnie whereas since its inception in 2010 small business saturday following between black friday and cyber monday has illuminated the significance of supporting small independently owned businesses across the country and whereas small business saturday is a day dedicated to supporting the diverse range of local businesses that help create jobs boost the economy and keep communities thriving across the country. And whereas the city of Santa Cruz celebrates our small businesses and the contributions that they make to our local economy and community. And whereas small business businesses continue to recover from the impacts of the pandemic and rely on the holiday shopping season for much of their revenue <coughs> and the support of local shoppers to their businesses each year to survive. And whereas 85% of small of Santa Cruz businesses are small businesses employing nine people or less. And whereas there are over 500 retail businesses in Santa Cruz providing nearly 4,800 jobs. And whereas purchasing goods and services from local small businesses keeps those dollars local and contributes to a more vibrant and sustainable economy, 
and whereas the City of Santa Cruz Economic Development Department has contributed to the Shop Santa Cruz Local, excuse me, Shop Santa Cruz Holiday Shopping Campaign to produce signage and advertising, in, and advertising encouraging local shopping and dining and promoting the impact that we can make when we support small local businesses. And whereas retail businesses across the country will be celebrating Small Business Saturday and encouraging shoppers to shop local. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim Saturday, November 27, 2021, as Small Business Saturday Day in the City of Santa Cruz and encourage all citizens to join me in shopping local today and throughout the year. Thank you, Bonnie, to your staff for getting that together for us and reminding us of all the value of our, of our local businesses. And let's all get out and, and uh, celebrate and shop, shop there on Friday. So thank you, Bonnie, thank you. for putting that together. And thanks, Rebecca, for working on that. We appreciate it. Thank you. Next up is item uh, number five on our agenda today, and that is uh, John Laird. Uh, and J Senator Laird is here today to provide the council and our community a legislative update presentation. Good afternoon, Senator. Welcome. <laughs> We're just uh, learning how to do this, Senator. So, <laughs> Bonnie, can you? So, is John? Is that the spot where he'll speak from? Okay, great. Good. Pardon? Okay. So this is a different city council chambers than you've probably seen, uh, right, John? <laughs> In any of a number of ways. <laughs> we had a big zoning map on the wall behind there. It was 30 years from a TV screen, I think. <laughs> That's great. It was good. Well, well, welcome, John. Thank you. Uh, th thanks for having me. And um, I think this is either the 16th or 17th city hall I've been to in the break. I have 21 cities. I can't believe it's taken me this long to get to my home city council. And it's interesting because we are over halfway through the legislative break, and I was really spending a lot of time talking about what we did this last session. And now it's starting to be also what does the next one look like? And the budget this year was phenomenal. Um, I was budget chair in my assembly run 15 years ago, and we always had about a $10 billion deficit and we're on defense the whole time. And to have $75 billion above projected revenues was unbelievable. And basically, we put half of it in reserves, or returned it to people that were struggling under COVID. And then we used the other half to move way ahead on things that were issues we want to invest in. The Medicaid age was lowered to 50. There were billions to broadband, billions to homelessness. We added childcare slots and added to childcare rates and childcare wages. Um, there was obviously homelessness, stuff on fire and water, major investments uh, across the state. And obviously, I was able to get the, together with Mark Stone the 14 and a half million that comes to this city to really try to do a shot in the arm to get ahead of the whole cycle of homelessness. And if you look ahead, the legislative analyst just released his forecast for the next budget year a few days ago. And he's estimating there'll be $51 billion above projected revenues this next year. $20 billion will go right off the top to schools under Proposition 98. And there will be a certain amount that has to go to reserves. And we might have to, for the first time in history, truly return money based on the GAN limit. And we'll have a debate about that. But it means that we will have probably at least in the neighborhood of $20 billion to invest in new ways. And I think that one thing I'm talking about is uh, dealing with the whole issue of um, affordable housing in the sense that we didn't have grants the way we have bonds, and it would be good to invest and to do that uh, uh, going forward. We have an issue because the building trades really want a prevailing wage, and that blows up some of the financing for nonprofits. But I think we can try to figure out how to negotiate a deal, try to figure out how to make that investment. And that's something that we uh, have to do. 
Um, the, the other major sort of off the top issue is well, the governor, when he announced uh, the surplus, said he'd like to spend it paying down the retirement fund, PERS and SPURS. And while I think we support that, <clears throat> we'd really look for some of these other investments as well that wouldn't go just to that. And so I, I had a Zoom yesterday with city staff members who are, I sort of said, don't count that before it happens because that's one that I think will be negotiated and really will be, will be changed. And um, I also just attended the climate conference in Glasgow. And it was very significant for any of a number of reasons because we're ahead of a lot of the other states in the country, but this last year was not a good year for climate policy in the legislature. It was good for climate budget investments, but not for climate policy. The Senate president has appointed a working group in the Senate to try to find common grounds, and I'm going to lead it, and we're going to just see if we can't get somewhere this next year on climate policy. And then on bills this year, uh, for myself, a uh, great bill locally by doing the Pajaro uh, River levee project, which buys out the local share from the state. I was working very closely with the person that's about to become your city manager on it, who's really very interested for the, the city of Watsonville. And uh, it also had a bill that was a fun bill because the, the, the governor appointed the first woman ever to be the head of the highway patrol, and all the code sections referred to he and him. So I did a bill that said <laughs> gender neutral the code sections, and then once I was rolling, CAL FIRE said, we have firemen, so I added all that. And the Conservation Corps said, we have Corps men, and I and added all that. And, and the general of the National Guard says, ours is just rife, so I couldn't even get that in one bill. I might have to do another bill to do that this next year. Um, I also did a major bill on fire because our fire prevention efforts are only what we budget in a year. And while they're plans, they're not anywhere in statute. And really, I authored a bill that says we will have five-year goals for, for controlled fire, for fuels management, for force management. We will have it adaptively managed to see if it's actually meeting the goals or doing enough. And we will have transparent reporting. It won't be up to the reporters to tell us what's being done. It will be reported out of the agencies in the state. And one of the biggest problems we had this year was with EDD. And I am the um, Senate lead on the Joint Audit Committee. And one of the audit recommendations was that there is no plan for recession uh, in EDD. So I did the bill on a bipartisan measure that says they will update and maintain all the time uh, a recession plan that the minute we head into recession, EDD will kick in. They won't cut surprise. They won't have 800,000 people waiting in line. The system won't crash. How can we be ready so that this just doesn't uh, happen again? And so it was, and on the budget, as chair of the Education Budget Subcommittee, we really restored, by the end of the budget, schools, K through 12, CSU, UCs, community colleges, not just to where they were before the pandemic, but a 5% increase. It means a lot to this community and what they come to UC. And, and we hope well, there's also a major fund for investing in housing. But if they have housing projects, uh, the state would directly invest we are hoping that, that that is a link that we can benefit uh, from here. And, and also the, um, the uh, UC Cooperative Ag Extension has, not been, has been just dying on the vine financially for 15 years or more. We got them a 55% increase to restore where they historically have been. It makes a big difference in agricultural counties. Uh, it would make a big difference to Santa Cruz and Monterey and San Diego in our region. And I was really pleased to be instrumental in that. And then on my own bills, one last one, because I got an award from the League of Cities, the organic diversion bill really gave a year's holiday on enforcement as long as cities and counties move ahead. 
Uh, but it was designed to leverage money. And we added $70 million for grants to cities and counties to try to implement the organic waste diversion, and that is in the budget. So hopefully, uh, Excuse you me, will can you repeat that? I'm having a hard time. Yeah, John, I think you. maybe a little bit. A little Bonnie, bit closer. Can that microphone be pulled closer? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, John. You have to <clears throat> That's okay. I'm always told to lean in, but it yeah. wasn't usually about lean the money. Lean in. Thank yeah, you. so but basically organic waste diversion, there will be $70 million of grants to cities and counties, and hopefully here uh, uh, you will be eligible and it will be able to help the, the landfill here. And then the last issue I wanted to mention, the, I think the most controversial issues we had this year were the two housing bills, SB 9 and SB 10, with regard to local zoning in housing uh, affordability. And SB 10 was amended uh, uh, to make it uh, more optional, but there was a measure in there that said that a, a two-thirds vote of a city council or two-thirds vote of a board of supervisors could overrule a locally approved ballot measure. Uh, that was a bridge too far for me. I voted against uh, SB 10. SB 9, which would allow extra ADUs on single-family lots, was amended heavily to allow councils to come in for historic preservation, for health and safety, required owner occupancy, and in the end, uh, I voted for it, and that's what uh, Mark Stone cast the exact same vote. And yet, each one got through the Senate with 28 yes votes. So over two-thirds of the senators voted for either of those bills. And I have found that that's been of major concern going to every city council that I have uh, uh, addressed in, uh, since we have uh, been in this race. With that, I was trying to do as brief a presentation as I could and talk about the budget and the bills and the biggest issues this year. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have on anything that was in the legislative session or you want to see in the next legislature. Thanks, John, and thank you. And you've been traveling. I know we're, you've got a big district, so thank you for making the time. And I hope council members might have some questions for John, and please signal to me if you've got any questions right now. Sandy, go ahead. Thank you for being here, <coughs> Senator Laird. Um, I appreciate your interest in focusing on uh, resources from the state for affordable housing. and. Um, you've heard and have referenced the concerns that are coming out of local jurisdictions related to, in this year, um, the two Senate bills, but there have been others over the past few years that have put us in a position of kind of losing some of our local authority about what we approve and under what conditions. And one of the concerns that I've had with those bills is that because of the way that our city had previously established inclusionary or an inclusionary ordinance and um, kind of had a framework for getting a certain number of units um, in those development projects in market rate units, low income units and or in lieu fees or alternative support for affordable housing, that the um, these bills are actually causing a reduction in the percentage of the overall units that um, are coming out of those new projects that will be affordable, right? So um, the fact that developers are allowed to, what I would consider double dip, and use the local inclusionary um, requirements to fulfill their um, commitment for an entire project, um, often with 50% more units. So I, um, I'm just wondering if in your conversations around uh, affordable housing resources, if that is in the mix in terms of how it would work with uh, market rate development projects or if that is something that would be more left to local jurisdictions and we can apply for competitive grants the way we do with the, for the pots of money that are currently available. Just wanted to hear your thoughts on how we, how we deal with that because wanting to use this legislation to actually um, induce additional affordable housing is the goal and we just haven't seemed to find a way to do that given the way the the legislation has been adopted and operationalized. Well, I, I'm <clears throat> in general where you are. It, and when SB 10 first came up this year on the floor of the Senate, I stood up and said, there's sort of this theory behind it that if we build more housing, that over time will lower housing prices and create affordability. 
And if we are really 3 million units short in California and we're building at the rate of 200 or 250,000 a year, that's not going to happen in the lifetime of a lot of us. And the issue of affordability is now. So I, I actually said I was going to be hesitant to vote for anything like this in the future unless there was a measure of affordability <coughs> with it. And the issue that you started out with was one that I got into some trouble for. One of the rare issues I got into trouble for when I was campaigning for the Senate, because I thought it should be up to local jurisdictions to decide whether the inclusionary or the affordable requirements were added to the existing requirement. <coughs> and you, you know, I had the misfortune of being sitting where you were are now after the earthquake. And, and when the St. George was rebuilt, the developer approached us and said he wanted to do, I think the initial proposal was 20% affordable housing. And we said that wasn't enough. And we pushed and pushed. I think we got to 45% before it was done because that's what we should be doing. And yet at the time, there were federal streams of money that don't exist in the same form that allowed that developer to go and fill in behind and get <coughs> to the 45%. Now we have state streams of money that might say, okay, you have this. And it doesn't seem fair to accept a state stream of money and you're supposed to provide a certain amount of affordable housing, but you provide it totally under local ordinances before that money arrives. And so there's got to be a way to see if there can't be some flexibility for for councils like you to leverage as much affordable housing as is possible when that happens. And, and there's Morgan Hill is in the Senate district, and the one bill that I think is going to be in front of you later today uh, invalidated their voter-approved growth management, and they're providing a little more housing as a result and less affordable housing within it. And I have gotten the director of the housing and community development department involved with the city of Morgan Hill to see if they can figure out a way that they're not being disadvantaged by these state laws. And it will be a real issue going forward. Uh, I just don't see doing an additional thing like that. I don't see voting to overrode lo local zoning, zoning in the rest of the time I'm in the Senate, however long that is, but I really think that no matter what you do, there has to be a measure of affordability that comes with everything you do in this council. Excellent. Thank you. Justin? Thank you, Senator Laird, for being here today <clears throat> and for allowing us this opportunity to ask some questions. Um, as the city's representative on AMBAG, uh, one of the things we've been discussing is the methodology around RENA numbers. And um, one of the things that's kind of come to surface is when cities are unable to meet their goals around very low and low. For example, SB 35 allows for certain housing projects to come in and, um, you know, not go to the planning commission or to the city council. You know, there's the option that staff can provide ministerial approval on those projects. And we're dealing, we're going to be discussing one of those today. One of the questions I had was, is there, and there's been some rumors floating around that maybe redevelopment is coming back. Maybe it won't, or, you know, there might be some form of funding, but I'm just wondering if there's any discussions around um, providing cities with fundings to produce affordable housing because I feel like, you know, when we're setting these goals around RENA and housing production, if cities don't have money to actually, you know, support the production of affordable housing, then, you know, we're kind of left with not many options. And then when things like SB 35 come in, it further takes away from local control. So I'm just wondering if there's any discussions around um, you know, allocating funding to cities to help support the production. Well, well I, I believe, as I sort of said earlier, that I would love to see direct allocations from the monies available for affordable housing. But the one of the largest revenue streams to cities for affordable housing was redevelopment before it was entered. And I support a limited revival of redevelopment solely for the purpose of affordable housing. There was a bill by Senator Bell that attempted to do this a couple of years ago, and it was vetoed by the governor. And so the question is, is whether we can figure out that there's a way to bring the administration along. But uh, one way or another, we it's not enough to just say, do this, and there's no tools to do it. And, and so that's the challenge. And 
I don't know if anybody's going to reintroduce that bill. I don't know if the governor has moved in any way, but it's like somehow money has to come to local jurisdictions to help them. And, and, and the RENA process, we just authorized on the audit, audit committee an audit of the last RENA numbers to see how it worked, how transparent it is, and, and that hopefully will be out before the, the process begins. But the, one of the last RENA processes, uh, I was in the assembly, and I was a representative from this council to AMVAG and was president of AMVAG when I was on the city council. I'm familiar with the process. But when I was in the assembly, the AMVAG decided Santa Cruz would get half the housing units and Monterey would get the other half, even though the population was distributed something like 60 40. And as a result, under Measure O and Measure J, there weren't enough units to accommodate what was assigned by AMBEG. And for a number of years, there was no county housing element. They, they couldn't approve one. And the county went without it for a number of years. And so one of the threshold issues is, is how AMBEG divides the number of units between each locality and gets there. Completely separate the issue you're asking about and everybody else is about whether there's some funding stream from the state that will help you with the affordable part of it. One other thing, as I was with the Director of Housing and Community Development and the Secretary visiting farm <coughs> labor camps, and they have considered possibly looping in university housing units. Because right now, right now, uh, the arena numbers do not take into account dorm rooms. And so the fact that there's 5,000 dorm rooms up there is an integral part of what the city does. And if they're building hundreds of new dorm rooms, even though that's not going to satisfy everything we need, it's, it's going to be progress, but it doesn't count in the whole arena system. And that's something that, that I've encouraged them to think about. The, the problem is, is that if if they do, then UC has to provide a measure of those units to be affordable. And I spoke to the Board of Regents last week and have spoken to the president and have let at least the president know that when we have that housing fund that is there, $2 billion in this budget to help higher education with housing, that if RENA required dorm rooms to be in it and some measure of affordability, that that state money could be used to help them with the affordability. More than you asked for. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, Sheva? Yeah. Thank you so much, Senator Leonard, for being here. Um, and thank you for your advocacy, the work that you've done to address the uh, homelessness issue here in Santa Cruz. I wonder if you could touch on, uh, so as you know, a lot of our street homelessness has been impacted by behavioral health issues. I wonder if you can touch on the efforts at the state level to address behavioral health and how that would kind of funnel into our local communities? Well, for the first time, I think, in the last budget thing, we were trying to make behavior health be a part of a lot of different things. I mean, for the first time, some grants to higher education to deal with it uh, uh, as part of homelessness. A and my experience, because I had the misfortune of being mayor at the time of sort of the modern homeless movement, people were arrested standing where I'm standing right now for a number of months when I was mayor. And uh, uh, and we really did the first River Street shelter and, and some of the other things at the time, and it just seemed like it was such a confluence of so many different things, of economics, of substance abuse, of mental health issues. Uh, uh, and with every person, it might just be one of them, or it might be a dual diagnosis. And so you have to bring all these resources to each of those different issues to truly impact it, in addition to the housing that we were talking about earlier. So we have put some money to it this year, but the question is, is how does that go? How does it work? Uh, uh, I am confident that we're going to hear it wasn't anywhere near enough to begin to address mm -hmm. it. And I think it's going to be important to get that feedback so that if we have extra money, we can continue down the path to trying to help. Thank you. John, I just um, was curious about, um, you mentioned climate policy, future climate policy coming out, um, and just sort of what, what are those areas of policy that 
the state is still looking to sort of accomplish? Well, the, the problem is, is that climate change is proceeding apace. So while we need to do things on the emission side that are dramatic, which is electrification, battery storage, uh, uh, many things that are away from fossil fuels, it's too late to stop some of the impacts. Right. And so, you know, we have these wild swings in precipitation. And so trying to figure out about water, and, and I worked with your interim city manager when she was water director, and we have a package in there that I hope to get accelerated uh, out of next year to try to deal with certain issues. Fire is another one that is a big one. We passed a bill on uh, ocean collaboratives regionally to start to, on a regional basis, address sea level rise and what the impacts are going to be and start to understand where we're going to have to guide resources. because It's already evident in the North San Francisco Bay Area with Highway 37 and highways along Marin County and certain places. And so while on the policy level it's electrification and reducing emissions, it's also on the mitigation and the adaptation and mm -hmm. trying to make sure that, that even if we did outstanding things to limit emissions starting today, we're still going to have to do it. Still have those issues. Mm -hmm. there be, as we know, with the fire burning, you know, close to the city limits and, and the reservoir being way down and other things, we're feeling the impacts of those already. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. And I think, you know, the one thing that's really sort of hit home with the climate change with at least neighborhoods and community people is, is that fire fire safety and preparedness, you know, and so the I think we have four fire wise groups now in the city and I think there's two more, you know, that are coming online. So which is a good thing to have neighborhoods really not only thinking about how to reduce vegetation and other issues like that, but that also to actually plan for evacuating together, you know, and knowing who lives alone and who has animals and all the things that go around with go along with fire wise neighborhood and I know that's one thing I get a lot of communications about from neighborhoods is, you know, can the city help us do this? Does the city have any resources? So as you're thinking through, you know, I know that the there's money that comes through the county and I think it also goes to the Fire Safe Council, but I don't know if there's, you know, and I know we've gotten, we've gotten a grant recently, but that kind of um, neighborhood input is really important, just not, not just for the physical sort of needs for, you know, getting their neighborhood more fire safe, but also just that collective effort of having a good, you know, communication system, you know, being able to understand who has what in their house, you know, whose cat needs to get picked up, all of those things that we've learned from other neighborhoods who have had catastrophic fires that, you know, those things just didn't get talked about. So any resources well, let, let, that, let me, you know, uh, could yes. be used. There were, uh, you know, I asked in the budget process, I was given one of the, the first question is because of schools, but I stepped out of line and asked how much of the fire money was going to be available locally to people, not to state agencies. Right. And it was going to be over four-fifths of it. And so we're trying to test to make sure that that happens. Okay. Okay. But I was resources secretary <coughs> at the time of the Paradise Fire. And it, it, it's hard to believe, but they had a complete evacuation drill four or five years before in Paradise. And they thought a fire would move in a way that they could evacuate by sector. And so they had this complete drill citywide. They knew they were in a, a, a high hazard area. And yet when the fire came, it was burning at the rate of 60 acres a minute. It crossed the entire city in 60 minutes. And, and it, 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 all their planning didn't anticipate that. And so that's the tough thing is you would think even in a, I never thought I would have to pack and be ready to go in a right. temperate climate along the coast, or, and we were the summer before. And, and all, I could only think of that, that a big wind comes in and it's really hazardous, this isn't a, a gradual thing. And so in the planning, you have to take that into account. And it's awful because you don't want to overly scare people, right. but you want a realistic view of what could happen and how people need to be ready. And, and the things you just said, you know, whether it's defensible space, having a plan, knowing where you'd meet people, uh, having the basics, knowing what you need to do right away, all those things are real and, and people need to think about that. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I appreciate, yeah, and I think that local, that local, you know, hopefully that will sift down to the locals and, you know, we can continue to have these neighborhoods be really proactive, which is great, I think. Any other questions for Senator Laird? Hi, thank Boulder. you so much for coming and thank you for um, allocating and helping allocate all that additional funding to schools. It's been greatly appreciated. A question that keeps coming to me from people around town um, is in regards to street drugs and crime and things like that that are just really impacting um, members of the community. And as a parent of two teenagers, something that's super terrifying is the fentanyl that's that's out there and there was a, an unfortunate incident that happened two weeks ago where a young high school student died um, and just recently in the county. And so it's just like, is there any talk about how we can address this as a state, this epidemic? Well, well frankly, there's plenty of talk. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is, is how to translate it into real meaningful action. Yeah. And, it, and it's on so many different levels. It's on prevention, it's on treatment, it's on saving people's lives in the moment. It, it's all those things. And, and uh, we're prepared to really support it from our level. And I know that I, I, I keep reading about San Francisco where they're agitating for a public health emergency to be declared. And it, 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 I like to tell the story that when I was in the assembly, a friend of mine was elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. And I see him on TV when he's elected, and he says, the number one issue in my district is meth. And so when I saw him the next time, I said, you know, when I was elected to the Santa Cruz City Council, it was potholes, it, it was traffic, it was all these neighborhood issues. How did you get to that? And he said, when I went door to door, that was the number one mm -hmm. issue that people raised. And so I, in these breaks, I'll meet with the health director and the social services director and the sheriff, and I was meeting with them all, and I said, do we have a meth problem? And it was like the number one cofactor for admissions to the jail, and it, and it was the number one cofactor for calls to child protective services, and it was overwhelming certain treatment. And it was like, when were you going to tell me? Because uh, uh, we went back and did things in the legislature to try to help locals cope, and I believe we need to do that now. And there was lots of discussion about it, and there were appropriations made this year, but I think they're out of proportion to the scale of the issue. And we're gonna have to go back and make sure we get there. And I'm feeling it from different parts around the district. Thanks for bringing it up. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Senator. We, again, thank you for all your work this year. You've made a huge impact in, our, in, in the city already, uh, first year out of the gate. So <laughs> we're just so thankful, and um, we learn from you every day. So uh, thank thanks you. so much. Thank you. I commonly say I know I don't have to ask you to stay in touch. <laughs> <laughs> so have I, a wonderful I holiday. To continuing <laughs> to hear from you. Thanks for uh, having me here today. Thank you bet. You. Thanks so thank much, John. You. Thank you. Mayor, really quick, we just heard some feedback. If council members can make sure to speak close to the mics and loud, the face coverings are kind of blocking some sound. Okay. And then anytime somebody comes to the podium, I'll make that have announcement. Them get really close and speak up. Okay. Okay. Okay, I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community te television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside of our chambers. Please note, if you attend the council meeting in person, face coverings are required to be worn throughout the meeting. You will be directed to enter only through the main entrance and exit through the side door. <coughs> Upon entering, please check your temperature at the digital thermometer on at the door. I ask that you are mindful and maintain at least three feet distance from others around you. For the consideration of our community, please stay home if you have any symptoms of a cold or flu or are feeling unwell in any way. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on 
and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment today during today's meeting, excuse me, are numbers nine through 21 on your agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification for today. Seeing none, I would now like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions or deletions to our agenda today. There are none. Great. I wanna make an announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item number 21 today. If you are participating virtually and wish to make a comment during, during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item 21. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on close on the closed session, please. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Myers, members of the city council. This morning, the city council met in closed session at 10 a.m. virtually via Zoom to uh, discuss the following matters. Item one was a conference with labor negotiators uh, involving the following employee organizations. Um, Fire IAF Local 1716, Fire Management, OE3 bid managers and supervisors, SEIU local 521, and unrepresented employees. A city council met with its uh, negotiator, uh, personnel director, Lisa Murphy, and uh, gave instructions. Item two is a conference with legal counsel involving anticipated litigation. Uh, the council consulted with the city attorney's office regarding potential initiation of litigation. Item three was a conference with legal counsel also involving anticipated litigation. Uh, the council uh, received a report on one item of significant exposure to litigation. Uh, there was no reportable action. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. We'll move on to item number six, our city manager report, and I'll ask our interim city manager, Rosemary Menard, to make that. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Um, Today, I'm just gonna give you some, a brief report. Actually, staff are gonna provide a brief report on some homelessness-related issues. First is uh, on the um, Hygiene Bay at the Housing Matters Campus. And for that, we will have uh, Ho Yi, who is, a, um, is the project manager from our Public Works Department to give you a brief update. And I hope she's online. Here she I is. I do see Ho, yeah. Hello there. Hi. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Myers and uh, members of the council. Um, so the Hygiene Day Remodel uh, Project is uh, located at the Housing Matters Homeless Shelter Day Service Building at 115 Coral Street. The remodel area consists of two floors. The ground floor work will include some demolition work for the installation of new walls moisture barriers, doors, partitions, and fixtures to accommodate six showers, four toilets, one urinal, and eight sinks in the shower and toilet area. A new boiler, hot water expansion tank, and hot water pump will be installed in the existing mechanical room. A new reception desk, cabinets, and bulb lockers will also be installed in the new reception area at the entryway. New electrical work includes new lighting, power supply for the new boiler, hot water pump, and bottle filling station, USB outlets for the lockers and reception area, faucet sensors, and a new electrical panel. The new HVAC work will include new ducts and exhaust fans installation. Two storage rooms on the second floor will be renovated into mechanical rooms to accommodate new HVAC systems and controls. So the project plans and technical specs are ready and a building permit has been issued. Um, once the funding source is secured, the front end specifications can be completed and the project can be brought to the city council for approval. Great, thank you. Questions? Are there questions about the hygiene? I had a hard time hearing and yeah. understanding yeah. everything. So I, I can certainly get a, a report later. Right, we can provide a, a little written summary. I know that um, we, we have one of those, but we'll provide that in writing. Apologize. I, I have oh. one quick question on that one, Rosemary. Um, so, my, so my understanding was we had about a half a million dollars that was, 
I believe designated towards that. <clears throat> Sounds like probably the, the bid probably came in higher than that. And so do we have to close that gap when uh, Ho mentioned, you know, the, the funding and would that come back to the council in terms of, you know, before that, that bid was accepted and, and a contract set up? So that's, yes. okay. Yes, so the, the um, there will be a, a formalized action that council will take to uh, authorize the issuance of the bid and then it will operate under a, a sort of standard public works construction project, which will allow you to um, take the low bid that's in the responsive, responsive responsible bidder the, um, the, it may be that we'll only get one bid, but under that process, the sort of standard construction project, if we only get one bid, that's fine. So we're working now to sort of finalize the bid documents and have um, identified a sort of an interim funding source. We like that word interim these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the idea is to, um, bring you back a budget amendment that would, uh, a budget adjustment that would allow us to use some of the ARPA funds that would uh, give us some money to work with on a variety of different actions and then to do the work that we're planning to do with the county on the 14 million and then sort of, uh, you know, uh, balance things up af after we get down with that process. So th I'm hoping that will come to you at next week, Sarah, the right. meeting on the 14th. So need to move that along. Thank you, I appreciate it. I know I've talked, talked to folks over at Housing Matters and they're, right. they're excited to get rolling on that. It's super, super important, so thank you for right. making that happen. Um, questions, other questions on that one? Okay, okay. Uh, so our housing, um, our homelessness response manager, Larry Amale is gonna give you update on some contracting and also some news on what, what the current plan is with 1220 River Street. Larry, before you start, um, we're just learning how to do this to try to maximize hearing for our public that may be watching. If you could speak pretty loud in your, also through your computer, because I think what's happening is just the room is not projecting very well, so it's very muffled. So Okay, I, yeah. will, I will work on my volume. Perfect, that's and, much better. And, and Larry, if you're in your office with the door closed, you can take your mask off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Welcome, Larry. And nice to hear from you. So, All right. to go. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Myers and members of the council. Um, I'm here to provide two, as Rosemary mentioned, two quick updates um, regarding efforts that we're moving forward to expand the shelter capacity for unhoused persons in the city. Uh, that was part of the direction of council in relation to the camping and standard services ordinance approved in June. Uh, so the first um, is that staff is in the process of establishing a transitional community camp at 1220 River. Uh, this location has been used previously as a managed campsite by the city. Uh, the model that we're pursuing this time is a bit different uh, in that all members of the camp will be vetted for their ability and willingness to comply with the set of agreements and ensure that the safe and healthy functioning of the camp. That's the agreement part of the transition camp. Uh, this camp will host approximately 35 participants, which is about half the number compared to the previous program that was established at 1220 River. Um, and with this model, city staff will provide daily oversight and will also be providing case management and connection services. Presently, uh, we're in the process of acquiring the requisite infrastructure to establish the camp, meaning tents, hygiene and sanitation services, refuse services, infrastructure for cooking, kitchen. So that's in the process of being acquired. Um, we're also in the process of developing the initial code of conduct for the camp. Uh, the agreement principles, uh, as well as potential camp participants are being identified by the city staff that is, are the stewards and the bench lands. And we've also started outreach to the community um, around 1220 River, both residents and businesses to inform them of uh, what our plans are in establishing this camp in that neighborhood. And our goal is to have this camp operational in the next few weeks. Uh, the second effort to expand shelter capacity is the establishment of a 24-7 program at the Armory Building on the South Lawn uh, to be operated by the Salvation Army. And the plans here is to establish a 75-bed uh, shelter that will be 24-7. 
uh, and will provide transportation to and from the site for participants, and there will be also be storage for their belongings on site. Uh, as part of the 75 um, beds, we'll have 10 spots reserved for overnight uh, and or emergency shelter. Um, in, in addition to just the 24 seven for the majority of the program. Uh, staff has been meeting with the Salvation Army and has developed a scope of services and budget. Uh, we're finalizing the draft contract that we plan to submit to the Salvation Army for review tomorrow. Uh, and we're expecting turnaround from their review in about three weeks. So our goal is to bring the contract to council for approval at the December 14th meeting. And those are my updates. Great job on the volume. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? I have a question. Justin? Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> I'll go Justin and then Chevra. Sorry, I gotta get used to it. I'm like looking at you on Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> Justin and then Chevra. Thank you uh, <clears throat> for that presentation, Larry. I had a couple questions. Um, I was wondering if you could just explain why the, if the number of beds that, that were previously occupied were about, it looks like 70 at 1220 River Street, the rationale, and why are we kind of cutting that number in half knowing that we need to try to maximize the number of beds? And we've done it, and it's been successful there before. Yeah, I think the, the answer is in, in looking at our overall planning and expanding the shelter capacity, which we, we detailed in, in more detail with the informational memo that was distributed at the November 9th meeting. But this strategy is a different model of encampment that it's not just aimed at trying to maximize our capacity, but really working towards outcomes and connections to permanent housing. And the best practices indicate that smaller Encampment smaller camps are going to yield better outcomes. And so what we're trying to balance here is expanding shelter capacity, but doing so in a way that is intentional and is hopefully going to improve outcomes towards permanent housing. So this first effort um, is this, uh, this model um, is a smaller number, uh, less concentration, um, but we're also proposing down the line to have a second transitional encampment. Can I, can I just add one comment to that, which I think is, one of the strategies of a little bit smaller is that you get to create a stronger, more functional community. And that also seems to be uh, an element of better success. Right. Um, yeah, and I think that that makes sense and has worked on in a number of different scenarios. So I appreciate that explanation for the community. Um, and I just had um, one more question and a comment. I was around the code of conduct, I'm just curious um, like what type of outreach process that is in terms of like our <clears throat> um, kind of providers being consulted, our people from the homeless community being consulted, because that's been a, something that's come up before in conversation is, you know, if we're going to have codes of conduct and the people who are going to be staying in these camps may need to have some ability to provide input on what is a good code of conduct and also working with the residents once they've arrived to kind of, you know, further formalize that code of conduct. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to that at all. Yes, that is part of the model, right? That um, there's a basic code of conduct, um, but part of the process is, again, you know, it's they're establishing and, and creating this community. So there'll be agreements that they help develop um, as well. Again, part of it too is, you know, uh, requirements around volunteering, attending regular camp meetings, um, establishing, you know, um, their individual goals towards stability, working with uh, the case coordination from uh, city staff. So that is part of the process and in, in, in playing that active role and creating their community there. Great, thank you. And then the last <clears throat> comment I had was um, a member of the public had reached out to me earlier this year. And one of the things that came up is that they'd mentioned that in, in the Salvation Army contract, there currently is no uh, unemployment insurance and they were saying that that's really critical to include in that contract so that if people get laid off or what have you that they can if there's unemployment that they can then um, turn to as far as um, resources for them to live off of so I, if, I think it would be important that if we before that contract comes to us um, that it be reviewed and if there is no unemployment insurance that we uh, try to include that in the contract as well for the workers Thank you. Those are all my comments. Thanks, Council Member. Right. Uh, Colin Terry jumped in, and then I'm going to get Council Member Boulder and then Council Member Brown. All right, I'm going to try to speak more clearly. Is that better? Okay. 
thank you for the presentation, Larry, and for all the work you, you've just kind of jumped in, right, to the cold end of the pole. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, let me look at my notes. Uh, so what, uh, are, do we have smart path assessors at these transitional encampments and at, and at um, the armory? And how are we tracking our efforts to connect folks to a pathway of housing? So that's my first question. Yeah, so the plan that we have for uh, the Salvation Armory, um, the Salvation Army operating the armory built into the scope is requiring uh, entry of information to the HIMS system that works with the county and that the various service providers are also connected to. So the intent here is to make sure that we're tracking and documenting, doing those assessments and in fact, making sure that the smart path assessment is done within 30 days is one of the things that we're looking at in terms of the reporting requirements associated with this contract. So that is built in there as well. Um, for uh, the connection, we're generally sort of looking with the transitional camps. Um, we'll have the uh, city staff uh, who are over providing oversight and that coordination will be working to make those connections to service providers as well. Okay, great. That was that was sort of the second part of my question is how are we linking to county staff and service providers because of the scope, the scope and the need is probably much broader uh, than what we can provide with city staff. So is there, Correct. so I guess is there, um, uh, do we have a mechanism by which that we'll do that? Yeah, that is presently the, the work that city staff, the stewards are doing in the bench plan is already establishing those connections, you know, as part of their work. And so that'll be the staff that is also working with the transitional camp. And so the plan is, is actually to continue that practice of connecting to services, whether it be HPHP um, or whatever the service provider based upon what the needs are of uh, the residents of those encampments. So case management is part of this process, articulating goals, and then working to connect them to those services. Great, and I hope that um, in future reports, when we've done the work uh, for some months, we'll be able to kind of bring that dashboard back of the progress we've made. Thank you so much for the work. Councilmember Golder. I just wanted to say thank you to Larry for <clears throat> moving so quickly. It's very impressive to see as some of the um, COVID COVID shelters are being closed down, that you've already, are already have plans to get, uh, I was estimating 110 beds up and running. And so that's only about 40 short of what our goal is. And so I just wanted to say thank you for that. And um, my one question is, um, in regards to having those beds turn over, is there um, a length of time or is it case by case or what's, what's the thought around that? Are these long-term or short-term um, situations for, for people? Yeah, the, the hope and, and the goal is to really kind of create turnover, if you will, or positive turnover um, in terms of what the length of stay is so that the idea with, with all this is to try to create pathways and pipelines towards permanent housing. So uh, explicitly with the transitional camp, what we're, we're proposing up front, and this is the first time we've done this model, but the proposal is as part of the case planning to have an initial six month period and then to have a formal process to extend three months and another three months as needed and you know, contingent upon how the case plan is being worked. So we're looking at this as well as the Armory of trying to create that um, positive turnover, if you will, um, through this process rather than simply just being a, a shelter with you know, no uh, trajectory towards housing. Thank you so much. And Councilmember Brown, and then uh, Vice Mayor Bruner also has a question there. Yeah, I, thank you for the update. I um, most of my questions have been answered for now. I have a question though about uh, given that these two locations are require uh, folks to be um, shuttled in and out. Is my understanding that's the way they've been operated in the past, and so the hours of entry and exit can be restrictive for folks who have schedules for, um, for work shifts, uh, appointments, et cetera. And I know that this has been handled sort of on a case-by-case -case basis in the recent past, and I wanna appreciate Megan Bunch from the city manager's office for really helping uh, to try to deal, to manage those. 
And so I'm wondering if you have plans for how uh, that might be handled kind of on a, on a more you know, uh, institutional level at the, with the sites. Uh, connected to that in the touring of the shelters that I did during COVID, um, to, and it was great to see all of this capacity that you know, uh, you know, emerged, and we had the the opportunity to um, really make a difference and, and give people some uh, some a little stability during that time. Um, the Salvation Army staff were having serious issues with uh, their ability to provide transportation because of their vehicles and, or lack of um, operational vehicles, let's say. So I'm just wondering if that's part of the conversation with potential contractors and also what the city might do to help facilitate that. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, as part of our conversations um, in developing the scope of services and budget with the Salvation Army, we've been discussing about augmenting the transportation. We're actually working on two tracks. The county still has transportation service that they're providing up uh, and to the armory and back. Um, one approach uh, would be to try to augment that and add another vehicle, additional drivers, um, but uh, not knowing whether that's possible, we've also engaged in conversations with uh, Salvation Army to see if they can operate that program. And they've indicated a willingness to do that and provided a staffing model and a budget to be able to support that. So uh, we're working on making sure that transportation uh, is available and fully accessible uh, as part of this effort. Uh, with respect to the uh, new camp at 1220 River, as mentioned, it's a different model. It's a much smaller um, encampment. Uh, and the, the approach here is that uh, the residents in the encampment are going to be able to come and go um, as they please. So transportation has not been factored into um, the operation of that camp. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bruna. Thank you. Um, my question um, was regarding uh, both locations and uh, the, the levels of entry that were needed. Um, so I, I think I understand somewhat from um, your earlier responses. Um, with 1220 River Street, it's a, a smaller size and um, a, a kind of open come and go with no restrictions. Is this, um, how, how, are, who, how are people prioritized? I'm just curious. Is that through city staff? Yeah, so, so for 1220 River and for this model, we're, as mentioned, we'll be vetting um, potential participants. So that is city staff that are having conversations with persons that are in the existing encampments uh, to see, uh, engage their interests and ability to work under that set of agreement principles. Um, so that is the process we're working. So we're identifying uh, potential candidates right now to be part of that first uh, transitional community camp. So that'll be the mechanism for that. So we'll tend to be, if you will, higher functioning or ready, to, uh, more ready to be able to connect to services. Thank you. And and the city staff, is that the outreach workers that are working? Correct. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah, Chris and Jeremy. Great, thank you. Great. Council Mayor, Mayor's um, question yeah. made me have another question. Um, uh, how are we responding to families with children and are we um, connecting them to the family shelter at Housing Matters? Are we connecting them with uh, county efforts to house families? So what are we doing when we come across families with children? Yeah, I, I can't speak to a specific case, but generally, um, again, it's, you know, the work of our, our outreach workers is to understand the needs of each of each of the members in the encampment and determine what the best uh, what the best effort of placement is and what the right step is to connect them to services that um, they need. So in that case, it would be trying to find an appropriate family shelter when possible and, um, you know, 
um, assessing kind of where their needs are at and what an appropriate placement is. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member um, Cummings. And one follow-up question um, regarding the the locations where people would be able to come and go. I don't know if I'd caught this correctly. Is that going to be at the Armory or just 1220 or both? Just 1220 is right. So there will be transportation to and from uh, the Armory. Great. Well, I think that does it on the comments. Yeah, I would just like to thank you, uh, Larry, for jumping in so quickly. Also, thank Lee, Megan, um, Jeremy, Chris, your, your whole team. We actually have an actual department team now, which is wonderful and um, just really good news. And thank you for your efforts to sort of, you know, move us to a level where hopefully people are getting the services and are get, starting to get into the system. Um, and then also hopefully we can see as as Councilmember Colontari Johnson mentioned, you know some of the some of, hopefully some of the data that shows you know beyond just having people sleep at night, what are the other things that hopefully we can get going so that people might be able to find their way you know into you know into some success around housing and other important needs and medical care and things like that. So thanks for thanks for moving so quickly. Appreciate it. Um, anything else? I just, on this? I just have one. Um, one additional item which should be obvious which is that the um, there are new indoor masking requirements um, by the health officer and uh, she has established this requirement and there is no end date or triage point in the future because i think we're all sort of wondering what's going to happen next and uh, this seems like it's a way for us to you know minimize the risk to the extent we can. So this, this uh, new indoor masking requirement. There you go. Okay. Um, I don't remember what the thing said, but we determined we changed the location of the 30th to, to virtual only. I don't remember if the calendar said hybrid or not, but that's, as far as I know, that's the only difference. Yeah. So for members of the public, um, the, the notice meeting for November 30th will be a virtual meeting, not a hybrid meeting. Okay, um, I will now go to item number eight. This is the, which is the council member opportunity to report on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authorities meetings. For future meetings, please come prepare, oops, prepared to provide an update on any, any meetings and actions that occurred since the last council meeting so the council and public can be informed. So I will just, I'm gonna start down on my left here and just go all the way through. And I'll uh, start with Councilmember Cummings. Great. Thank you, Mayor. I'll start. Um, I, I did want to highlight one thing, which is I noticed that um, I know that we had changed the composition of the Revenue Committee, and so I think that would be good to have that updated on um, the membership of groups. Just want to put that out there. Um, so to start um, AMBAG, <clears throat> there's still been a lot of discussion around ARENA methodology. and. And based on public input at, um, that came before that meeting, uh, it sounds like AMBAG is going to have, they didn't, we didn't adopt our uh, local or regional methodology at this meeting, and they're going to come back uh, likely at a special meeting in December so that we can um, formalize that. And I do believe that we're going to be having a special um, study session on RENA for the city, so that'll be great for us. And is that the meeting on the 30th? Yes. 
Right. So, yeah, so mem for members of the public, we will be having a special meeting on um, RENA numbers on November 30th, and it'd be great to get um, people to come so that they can learn more about that process and so that that can help inform, um, you know, it'll help for me to understand where the community is at when going back to AMBAG uh, for that special meeting when we finalize our methodology. Um, LAFCO, there were um, six parcels that were annexed, uh, totaling four acres into county service area 10. Um, we, they, we passed a similar resolution to the city council uh, to continue with remote meetings or hybrid meetings in accordance with AB 361. And I think the most important action that came out of that meeting, or one of the, the most important actions that came out of that meeting was that uh, for years, the LAFCO has been using county council as their legal counsel. And uh, at that meeting, we decided to move forward and approve two contract agreements to hire Best Best and Krieger as LAFCO's legal counsel and Palantuono and Highsmith and Watley as LAFCO's special legal counsel. Uh, the reason why we moved in that direction, especially knowing that there are a lot of um, potentials for LAFCO to weigh in on legal actions around land use within our community, we found that we thought that it was really important that we have uh, legal counsel that's, um, that specializes in LAFCO rather than just having general legal counsel. And so um, the, the two groups that we have hired um, are specialists on LAFCO specific law. And so that will really help us, um, especially if we end up uh, in any legal uh, battles around LAFCO. Um, the Climate Action Task Force is still working towards its 2030 Climate Action Plan. I know that many members of the City Council had an opportunity to meet with Tiffany Wise West to get an update on that. Um, and during that meeting, we discussed um, a lot of the kind of statewide uh, greenhouse gas emission forecasts and targets, and you know had a discussion around where we should be, kind of um, in terms of how we want to address um, climate action and our what our goals should be. We really had a discussion around, you know, whether we should really, you know, bold, hard approach to trying to reach these emissions more quickly. Do we take a more um, kind of loose approach at setting our goals pretty low with the objective of trying to, you know, go beyond them? And so that discussion is still ongoing, and um, we'll likely come back to us at our next meeting in terms of where we want to set our goals. It was really an opportunity to get input from the group on goal setting. Uh, lastly, um, I'm not the representative of the Criminal Justice Council, but I did attend the meeting. Um, and uh, one of the goals for this year was to um, evaluate and assess, the, and, and I should preface this, that you know, in the response to the murder of George Floyd, a lot of um, local agencies and municipalities began reviewing laws around uh, use of force and accountability. And earlier in the year, um, uh, Chairman Friend, Criminal Justice Council agreed to um, work with all the agencies um, to see where there was alignment in our policies and where, when there was an alignment, just to try to indicate, you know, why there's not alignment and um, what, and then to create this report and bring it back to all the agencies. Um, I played a major role working with uh, Chairman Friend, Supervisor Friend, on this effort, and at the last meeting, the Criminal Justice Council unanimously approved the report. And there was a recommendation that this report go back to um, each of the cities so that they can have their councils get an update on that and review the various policies that are in place and that are not so that councils can provide any further direction on whether or not they want to adopt certain policies or if they want to leave the um, policies as they currently are. Um, and so that concludes uh, my report. And I'll turn it on to Renee. Okay. Thank you. Um, I attended the Downtown Management Corporation meeting on November 18th with Vice Mayor Bruder and Mayor Myers. And um, I'll just briefly highlight um, that uh, they're gearing up for downtown holiday shopping and starting with an increased CSO presence starting um, December 1st. And they were excited, the um, police department's excited to announce there's 10 officers in training and will hopefully be hitting the street soon. Um, there was a number of notable events that happened in the last month downtown, including some fairs, a roller skating party, restaurant week, and Halloween. Um, working together, they created a safety plan to ensure that um, residents and visitors were all safe um, 
during the first in-person Halloween celebration in the, I don't, I guess two years? Last year, I guess, just last year. Mm -hmm. But either way, it was, it was a successful uh, month and um, people are really excited to get out and um, start their holiday shopping locally. Vice Mayor Brood. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, the last visit Santa Cruz board um, was, the meeting time was changed to the same time and date as one of our council meetings. So um, council member Watkins and myself were unable to attend that board meeting. Um, I did uh, attend the council ad hoc revenue committee meeting. We had a financial status update and kind of caught up on some background um, dates and timing of ballot measures and uh, looking at uh, reviewing different types of taxes and revenue sources and items and um, going through a whole spreadsheet uh, and, and just kind of an overview and also looking at other cities and counties and potential solutions to the city's recurring revenue needs. Uh, and we will be meeting weekly uh, with that committee. Uh, Let's see, I am an alternate on the uh, area agency on aging and um, there was a two hour um, uh, onboarding for new members that um, didn't happen when I first joined. So it was great to attend it um, this time and there were a lot of, there was a lot of good information um, from the history of the, the, the um, organization to a lot of facts uh, regarding seniors and the fact that the 60 plus population has grown by over 40% since 2010 in California. And Santa Cruz County, the 60 plus population has increased by more than 58% since 2010. Um, and the over 60 Medi-Cal eligible population grew 92% since 2010. And um, uh, we talked about senior services funding, uh, cost of long-term care, different topics such as senior loneliness and isolation, seniors in COVID-19, and homeless seniors. Um, there are twice as many homeless people over the age of 50 as, they, as there are under the age of 25. And um, in the 55 plus population, homelessness is identified as a trigger for mental health issues. Um, so, we also talked about the state role and the seniors council and basically the overall service support and advocacy role of this agency. Um, and then I will pass it on to Mayor Myers. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I'll report out on a couple, a couple of committees that I am on. Um, one being the, um, I just want to make clear for the public, um, there was a shift in the revenue committee membership. Um, it's now myself, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, and um, Council Member Watkins, um, and we'll be working moving forward. Um, on the, uh, I also attended this month's, um, this quarter's City Select Committee, which is a committee comprised of all the mayors in the county along with county staff. Um, that meeting was last week and we received a full uh, update on uh, COVID-19 and the current surge as well as the mask mandate that went into effect in um, uh, starting this, this Monday and uh, got a sense from the county's dashboard on where things are going. Uh, good, some good results and news um, throughout the county, many, a, a very good uptake in boosters 
shots um, shown and also um, people seem to be able to get to the booster shots pretty mm -hmm. easily. There's various ways to get there, but you can either go through the appointment, but there are some drop-in places as well, but people are getting out and getting their boosters now, which is great. Um, still slow on getting uh, vaccines to the 20 to 29 year old group. Um, don't seem to see a lot of uptake there. Um, and so that's a place to work more intentionally. The city actually, um, you know, due to adv also advanced testing with schools and things, we are seeing, um, you know, some cases and we are actually, uh, unfortunately in, in number one now in terms of the number of cases in the city. So again, uh, some of that is because of the more advanced, uh, because of the more regular testing that people are doing, but also um, we still have some, um, you know, some age groups that need to, you know, hopefully get in and feel like they can um, contribute and get in and uh, get their vac vaccinations underway. Um, so the other thing that the City Select Committee um, learned about is a new fellows program at Cabrillo College. Um, it is a fellows program fashioned to recruit uh, young people into uh, government uh, jobs and roles. And uh, it's being sponsored by a number of retired um, city managers, uh, CIOs, other different <coughs> government leaders. And um, the program will place fellows in, in various government institutions, but um, government is one of those places that's taking a hard hit right now on terms of people's um, goals in life um, for, for, for you know, various reasons over the last few years as we've seen. Um, but there was a real effort, and it sounds like a really neat program that started at Cabrillo, um, and uh, definitely worth checking out. Uh, and they're asking for support from each of the local governments, if, if, if possible, to contribute to the fellows program so that there's um, some sustainability there with regards to student availability. <laughs> uh, I also serve on, um, the homeless two by two committee. And um, I think I went to my last meeting um, <laughs> just a couple weeks ago. Um, we continue to make progress. Um, some of what Mr. Mwali um, really presented today really shows the hard work of the two by two, I think over the last year. Um, concurrent with the city um, passing the two ordinances that we passed, we were also in a lot of deep conversation and also really working with the county to bring resources for the safe sleeping sites and continuing to outreach, to get the outreach, case management, all of those services. So as we were doing our own policy work, we were certainly the mayor, myself and the vice mayor, we were there at the table with the two by two and with our um, elected colleagues as well as a county leadership staff and with our city manager, both our retired and, and also interim city manager really just trying to craft a plan, a county, a plan with the county, plan of action, plan um, of trying to, uh, you know, make sure people don't fall back after getting out of the COVID hotel, out of the hotels, but also more importantly, really kind of developing a system-based approach to all of this. So um, we've had, I think, some successful meetings. We've had some hard meetings, um, but I think we're in a very functional situation with the county now. And uh, we learn a lot from them and they learn a lot from us. <laughs> it's always a spirited, uh, spirited meeting for sure. Um, let's see, Central Coast Energy Policy Board, our next meeting just for the public is December 15th um, from nine to noon. And I'm uh, just scanning through here. Um, maybe Council Member Kalantari Johnson and I'll have you do the Metro update and I think that will be it on my, the CALS working group is um, also still meeting. Um, focus obviously will be for next summer. Uh, we're doing some work with Stanford University to look at um, some additional studies in the area of CALS and uh, hopefully we can bring more information to that, about that to, um, to council and the community at some point in time. Save the Wave still continues to facilitate that group and um, has brought in a number of resources, including a, a oceanographic um, study through Stanford University. So, and our own um, water quality laboratory is key to really uh, identifying additional work that needs to be done um, to really make sure that we can keep cows off the beach bummer list. And that is the kinds of things I've been doing. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, so it's been a relatively quiet uh, month with uh, 
external agencies on which I sit. Thank you, Vice Mayor Bruner, for the update on the orientation. I wasn't there I, um, as a member that's been on that body for the past five years. I didn't make it, but I'm glad to hear that you got oriented and um, hope you'll have opportunities to join us or join the group when I'm not able to be there. Uh, I have just a little bit on the Regional Transportation Commission and, and transportation funding in particular. Uh, so we have um, been, as we track the funding that's coming through a variety of revenue streams, we uh, things are looking good um, or better than perhaps anticipated. And so our Transportation Development Act uh, funding, which is funding through Caltrans, uh, so far this fiscal year, we've been on track, to, we've exceeded the estimated, the projections by about 20%, if you average it out over the months. So we are uh, doing all right in that regard, although the costs of construction and all of the infrastructure related to um, both our rail corridor, the highway, streets and roads, obviously those costs are going up. But we are in um, relatively good shape with the funding picture. Uh, forecasting ahead, uh, I was informed that the infrastructure, the most recent infrastructure bill, which the IIJA, and I'm going to forget what it's, the Infrastructure <laughs> Investment and Jobs Act, um, does have additional funding for uh, local jurisdictions like ours. So, so we will probably be receiving about 30% more uh, in funding through that particular revenue stream. And um, there is a, in, in that bill and through communications with the Federal Highway Administration, it, it, it seems clear that um, active transportation is becoming more and more of a priority. And so uh, as a community, I think that we're really well positioned to be competitive for some of that, uh, that funding where, where there's competitive grant funding because we have a real focus on active transportation. So um, looking forward to uh, accessing uh, you know, additional resources for our local projects, both through the RTC and I think the city as well, which will be um, you know, competitive for those, those grants. So I'll, I'll um, leave it there. I don't believe any of the other uh, groups that I sit on have met since, our, since we spoke, since I was updating you all last. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Councilman. Council Member Colin Terry Johnson. Thank you. I'll pick up the transportation thread and give an update on the Metro uh, Board. So uh, Mayor Myers and I, the, who sit on that Metro Board, went to a couple of strategic planning sessions over the last couple of months. And uh, I won't go into all the details, but a big conversation was the role of Metro as we think about climate action and climate <coughs> response. That was sort of the big picture conversation we had. Um, Let's see, uh, there was a report that we have seen increased in ridership, mostly due to the university, the UCSC students returning, but we are still about 45% below pre-COVID numbers, but we're inching our way there. Um, we've had a difficult time with uh, hiring bus operators, but the good news is that we recently hired eight bus operators to be trained in December and get them in the queue. And the big news that we got just last Friday is that our CEO, Alex Clifford, announced that he will be resigning and taking a position in San Joaquin, is that correct? Yeah. So that was, that was the big news. So we'll be doing a national search for a new CEO for the Metro. Did I miss anything, Mayor Myers, on the Metro board? I think, I think that's, that's, those were the highlights, yeah. Okay, I had one yeah. more committee. Okay. Yeah, please go. Um, so I've been appointed, I was appointed last year to the Youth Action Network, previously the Youth Violence Prevention Task Force. And they haven't really been meeting because they've been in a, a year long sort of strategizing and reconfiguring what, what the purpose of this group is. Um, they have really shifted their focus to, to um, building youth leadership and building youth capacity to be engaged in the community. So they've restructured and they've set their steering committee as a, a youth body. So they've just recruited 13 members from throughout the county. I believe there are three youth steering committee members who are from the city of Santa Cruz. And these are youth who participate in various youth um, councils and groups throughout the community focusing on different issues such as uh, childhood obesity, youth homelessness, uh, climate action. And so they've come together in this countywide council. 
They've also reached out to youth who haven't been engaged in this way um, in their previous years. So, so really a diverse group of youth. So 13 members, I had the opportunity to meet with them or most of them a couple of weeks ago. And um, as a follow-up, there was a meeting with the Youth Action Network with a representative from each of the four cities as well as a county representative for us to look at what does it look like to have the youth voice and youth engagement in government decision making. So more on that coming. Great. Thank you, council members, for all your updates and um, also for all the time you put into these other boards and commissions and committees. Um, sometimes they take as much time every month as, as being in, in council sessions. So thank you for spending the time with these other community <laughs> um, needs and important, out, important items. Next up, uh, we have our consent agenda for today. Uh, and these are gonna be items number nine through 16 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items nine through 16. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or, on or pull any items today? Uh, I've got council member Cummings, vice mayor Bruner and council member Brown. Council member Cummings. So I have a comment um, for items number nine, um, nine and items number, number 14 and then I'd like to pull item number 10. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. I had a question on item number 12. Okay, Council Member Brown. I was actually interested in item 10 as well, so I'll Ten. wait for that. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, let me just put these down. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead um, and move to the um, items that were um, that were there were either comments or questions on, and I'll take um, item number nine from Council Member Cummings. You had a comment. Yeah, it's speaking to the teleconference meetings. Um, you know, now that we've had a new mandate, mask mandate that's come forward, kind of saying that we need to wear masks inside. I'm wondering if there might be. The need to create some kind of policy around whether there are thresholds that um, that then allow us to go back to virtual meetings versus hybrid versus in person. Um, just because we're going to start getting comments and questions from the public around, you know, if this meeting is hybrid, but then the meeting on the 30th is virtual, and then our next city council meeting is hybrid, and if we're seeing numbers go up, when do we actually go back to just being virtual? And so, um, just wanted to put the comment out there that it might be worth us coming up with some kind of policy so that we can have clear guidelines for when we're gonna have hybrid versus virtual versus in person. Okay, we'll move on to item number 12, unless there's any comments, I, I we'll just we make that. We don't have that policy now, and I think right. it's, uh, it's a good point, obviously. Um, I don't know if we wanna get in the business of making sort of triggers in, in certain ways, but it's worth thinking about, so we certainly can do that. I don't know, Tony, do you have anything to add? Uh, let's see, uh, Council Member Cummings, you had item number 14. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank Mayor Myers for putting this item on the agenda. This is the opposition to California Citizens Redistricting Commission, uh, preliminary redistricting maps, and some of the maps that initially w that were produced were kind of splitting the Monterey Bay Area region in half with regards to our Senate representative, and then completely excluded the city of Santa Cruz from the Monterey Bay Area with regards to um, congressional, our congressman, and our assemblyman. And so I just wanted to thank the mayor because it was a really quick turnaround on that. Um, and uh, it was just, and then, you know, being able to just ratify that letter today that went to the redistricting committee, I think is a great move for us to be able to express our opinions before those maps were adopted and, and the public comment period was over. So I just wanted to thank you for bringing that forward. Yeah, and I, I want to thank you back because you were you were watching that and you you know you were on top of it and so thanks for bringing that forward and our staff also helped with getting that done so thanks. Um, could I add just one thing? Um, I heard on a Monterey Bay Area managers 
recall last week that a number of people in Monterey County, as well as well, mostly Monterey County, are very unhappy about what's going on with this process elsewhere. Um, I heard a story, for example, King City, which is not a huge place, has two zip codes and they were split. And that's like the community of interest idea that we've been hearing about with respect to setting district lines does not seem to have been paid attention to. Yeah, the other thing I might mention is that um, I believe the city of Capitola also utilized our letter. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna be submitting that as well. So that's great, yeah. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and go to council member Golder. You had a question on item number 12. Is that you? Bruner. Oh, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Bruner <laughs> wrote in the wrong column. Um, my question was, um, can you remind uh, remind me and members of the public the process for applying for um, advisory body positions? So, Bonnie, do you want to do that? Yeah. Um, Thank you. They just need to submit an application. We have it online. It's a fillable PDF. They can do it online and just email it directly to us. And then th that is what we put in your binders for the annual appointments. And is there a deadline to apply? Deadline to not stand. It's January. Hopefully, yes. What? I just 12th. said yes. The twelfth of January twelfth. January. Thank you. Um, the the current website has the list of vacancies, or it has the yes. Well, it has the yes. It does both. Yeah. I think cityofsantacruz.com advisory bodies or. It's, um, I think it's government advisory bodies. Okay. City of Santa Cruz government Mission, advisory yeah, bodies. Advisory bodies, yeah. Thank you. And also I would recommend people to look at, there's um, bylaws on each page to kind of get a feel if you're interested in a specific <laughs> mission to see what they do. Right. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Council Member Cummings, you pulled item number 10. Oh, excuse me, I'm gonna take this out to public comment now on the items that were um, not pulled. Um, so I'm gonna, if there are any members of the public, uh, I see them, hang on. <laughs> um, if there, Bonnie, can you track that now? Okay. If there are any members of the public who wish to comment on items on our consent agenda, with the exception of item number 10, which has been pulled, now is the time to do so. Please line up to my left on the designated markers. There's no one in the chambers. <laughs> if you're attending virtually, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. And I would go ahead and take uh, comments from Zoom callers first, and then we would take in person, we just for the public. There's no one in the chambers with us today. Um, Bonnie, do we have anybody on on Zoom? We do. We do have one. Where do I? Where am I? Yeah. Hi. This is Mr. Phillip here. My my two points on the item 14 state redistricting map letter questions your main point of opposition that splitting the Monterey Coast into two districts lessens political influence of the Monterey Bay region insofar as simple math says two representatives is more political influence than one, assuming there is cooperation. Additionally, the idea a Senate district and assembly districts should have the same boundaries is extraordinarily subversive and is an attempt to convert our democratic republic into a pure democracy. The Senate and assembly have different functions in our democratic republic, and they can have different boundaries, and that's okay to protect minority representation, such as, for example, small rural communities versus mega-populous cities, each having disproportional Senate numbers versus population. You might want to pull that subversive Senate boundary language. Um, otherwise, and I hope I'm reading it right, the proposed map is pretty strange of splitting districts with one adjacent from Aptos all the way down past San Luis Obispo. It's not that conspiratorial to suggest redistricting is always, always about politicians picking voters. I'm pretty sure there are no Republican districts within 100 miles of the Bay Area, although San Luis Obispo does have one, so perhaps that split is likely for a uh, Democratic supermajority power grab reason trying to take a Republican seat. As with all 
the III type uh, agenda items that come before the council, we typically never hear much of the other side as in what are all the reasons for the current proposed map. Otherwise, Republicans are not really much of a state factor. It's equally likely the redistricting is also occurring as a tug of war between Democratic liberals and far left leftists, the DSA socialists and the closet communists, of which I speculate uh, there are all the above as state reps, uh, kind of like the hearsay politics here in Santa Cruz. I'll just wildly speculate that since the council out progressives are the ones supporting the opposition of this uh, um, split, creating inclusion of San Luis Obispo, it is because it would potentially lessen progressive influence in that Thank district, you. even Thank as you. the overall state Democrats Thank try to take you. away a Republican seat. With all okay. We'll now um, go on to, I'd look for a motion uh, on uh, the remaining uh, items on the, uh, on the items that were not pulled on the consent agenda. Are we doing manual hands or? Virtual? I think it's easier for me if we do. Virtual? Yeah. Virtual? Manual. No? I mean, in person. In okay. person. Right. <laughs> we have hands. a lot going on up here. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. It's like Green hands, hands, not yellow hands. I'll move the uh, items numbers. Um, with the, I'll move the consent agenda with the exception of item number 10. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, I will second that motion. Okay, great. We have a motion by council member Cummings, seconded by, by, by Vice Mayor Bruner to um, move all items on the consent agenda with the exception of item number 10. And can we just, uh, we can do the good old fashioned kind, right? All in favor? Or do we have to go roll uh, call? No, I'll we'll have to do a roll we call. We should do roll call? Okay. Yeah. Can we have a roll call vote? Council member Watkins is absent. Ellen Terry Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now come back to item number 10, which was pulled by Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. This item number 10 is a firm consensus to disband the Santa Cruz City County Task Force to address UCSC growth plans. And I'm in no way um, opposing the recommendations because we've discussed this as the task force and the rationale behind it. Um, I did want to add uh, a recommendation that the um, council members who've been involved continue um, informally um, having conversations with our county representative. And because there was an addition of language to that motion, I just wanted to, I didn't know if it was appropriate to add it at the beginning or if it was more appropriate to pull it. So I pulled the item for that purpose just to add um, additional language, which I sent to Bonnie. Um, and it shouldn't, I mean, really it's just encouraging the members who have been working on this to continue uh, informally and discussing this with our county representative. The only thing I would ask is if there's a, the only, yeah, the only re the only thing I'd look for Tony's response is there is there any Brown Act issues with that? Because I know that right now the members of the task force, the seated members were myself, Councilmember Cummings, Councilmember Brown. So I'd either direction to us on what that would look like. I, that's my only question. I'm not I'm not saying it's not a, a good. Uh, what I would recommend is that um, Councilmember Cummings' comments be reflected in the minutes but that the council not take any formal action toward establishment of a working group. Right, and that was the intent. It's not a, it's not a direction of creating a group. It's just a recommendation that we continue having discussions with them. So if that's the best way to have it included that, so that it's informally and it's not a, it's not a formal. Right, I think that's appropriate that, that the comment be reflected in the, in the minutes. In the minutes. Councilmember Brown, did you have a comment? I, yeah, I just, I just wanted to add, I, I do support um, making some statement that uh, creates space for those continued conversations. And I, I want to say this mostly for the public, if you're listening in. Um, those of you who have been involved in the task force efforts and in communication with us over this period of time that we were, we were con formally uh, uh, meeting, uh, may have noticed that we're now that that space has disappeared <laughs> and and um, so we wanted to uh, and I've talked with the third district supervisor with uh, supervisor Coonerty as well who is willing to continue to have meetings that allow for us to 
um, do a bit more of a public facing conversation with the community about concerns around the LRDP. The intention is not to make this a space for folks to ask us about what's happening with the city and county in this next phase of discussions with the university, but rather to continue to talk about cons community concerns and, um, and be available to the public in that way. So I just wanted to um, be clear, and we talked about that when we decided to, um, to formally close the, the official group, that um, we wanted to be um, open and available and, and make it somewhat transparent. And there, I've, I've heard from people who, that, who said, well, we just, you disappeared and we don't, you know, and I said, well, you can call, you can always contact me. Well, it's a little different than you know actually creating a space. So we will be talking about the possibilities of holding meetings from time to time that um, will hopefully meet that need and, and interest by community members. Uh, I guess it's just one other thing to say on the, that that topic, um, and then I think Tony might have something else to add. But uh, the staff is. For, uh, proposing and trying to get organized for a listening session with some of the folks that have been involved in this process over time and so that we can hear what their concerns are and bring those to the process that we're now working on internally. Great. And then working on scheduling that. Great, thank you. So uh, the, it sounds like what we'll do is um, have this um, in the motion, Tony, that this comment would be reflected in that on, for in the minutes for that item. Does that sound right? Yeah, I okay. would suggest that the motion be acted upon, and then um, ask the city clerk to let the record ref reflect Councilmember Cummings' recommendation. Great. So I would look for a motion on item number ten on the consent agenda, Councilmember Cummings. You, didn't, you need um, public comment. Oh, oh, sorry. You're right. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring this out for public comment. For members of the public who may want to um, comment on item number 10 on our consent agenda, which is the uh, affirm consensus to disband the Santa Cruz City County Task Force to address UCSC growth plans, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Just, I'm not seeing any folks. Okay, seeing none, um, I would bring it back to council for a motion. I've got a motion started there with council member Cummings and a second, I'll seconded second. by council member Brown. And can we do a roll call vote, please? Council member Watkins is absent. Um, Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Meyer? Aye, that motion passes unanimously. Next up, we have item number 17, and this is extending the emergency ordinance number 2020-27, authorizing temporary use of certain adjacent public street and outdoor areas for all eligible businesses impacted by indoor business closures related to the COVID-19 pandemic until December 31, 2022. If you do want to comment on this item, now is the time to line up to my left or call in using the instructions on your screen. Since this is the second reading of the audience, ordinance, excuse me, we will not have a staff presentation. If there are no questions from council members, we will go right to public comment and then council action. Are there any questions for, from council members on this? Okay, then I will go ahead and take this. Um, I still need to do public comment, right, Bonnie? So I'll take this out for public comment. This time, if you would like to speak to this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. Is there anyone in the audience today or in the chambers? There's no one in the chambers uh, that would like to speak to item number 17. Seeing none, I'll bring it back for a motion on this item. Take, I keep looking that way first. It's like my natural reaction. I'll take Council Member Colantari Johnson as the motion, seconded by Council Member Cummings, and we'll do a roll call vote. Council Member Watkins is absent. Colantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. 
And Mayor Myers. Aye, that motion passes unanimously. Okay, we are pretty much right on time. I'm gonna take just a five minute break. Or let's take a 10 minute, well, let's take a five minute break. Let's not break our streak. Um, <laughs> we'll come back just to, I know my, uh, I need to adjust some things here at my desk. So let's take a five minute break. We'll come back at 2.50, thank you. <laughs> Okay, we got everybody back. Everybody, how do we do on time? Five minutes. Next up, we have agenda item number 18, which is consider motion to rescind the City Council's October 12, 2021 denial of the 831 Water Street Development Project. <coughs> For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wanna comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, kind of let everybody know what, what the, with the roll. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna go ahead and hear any updates on this item from our staff. Um, so we'll have a staff presentation. I'll then uh, take this out. Oh, we'll have questions from council. If there's um, no questions from council, we'll take it out to public comment. I'm gonna have the Zoom, Zoom people go first. And right now, that looks like all we're gonna have today. There's no one in the chambers. I have approved the following groups for extra time for three minutes, 831 Responsible Development, Santa Cruz Yimby, and Santa Cruz Tomorrow. If there's other uh, members of the public after those approved for extra time, we'll go ahead and give you one minute and we'll be taking public comment for up to 20, excuse me, for up to 45 minutes on this item. So I'll go ahead and turn this over to Darcy Pruitt our deputy city attorney, and Samantha Hashert, our principal planner. Does Darcy, is Darcy in, Tony? Um, I, Hi, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Darcy, we see you. Hi, um, I didn't realize I would actually be presenting this item, but um, I can give you sort of a rundown of the um, issues. Um, as you know, the um, council approved um, a motion to deny the project based on non-compliance with objective standards. Um, and that was actually based on the council's decision back in, I think, October 7th to have all of the projects that involve both SB 35, which is um, streamlined ministerial approval for affordable housing projects and projects that included density bonus to come to the council um, as allowed under SB 35 for um, uh, public review. Um, ordinarily, most jurisdictions have addressed these SB 35 projects ministerially at a staff level, um, but the council felt that it was important um, with the novel um, uh, issues involved at the site to actually have the project come for public oversight to the council. Um, the staff did a very thorough review of the project based on all of the objective zoning subdivision and design review um, and gave the council a very extensive list of the ways in which the project complied and did not comply with both the requirements of SB 35 and the city's objective standards. Um, the city council found that the applicant had not provided enough information to review all of the project's compliance with the city's objective standards and also had concerns that the, 
placing all of the affordable units in one of the buildings um, might violate state and federal laws for um, a variety of reasons um, that affect segregation. <coughs> and um, the city disapproved the project um, as not complying with state law and federal law and the city's objective standards. Um, since that time, we have received letters from a variety of places, including the applicant, the California Department of Housing and Community Development, and uh, private uh, nonprofit housing organizations threatening litigation against the city there have also been other SB 35 projects that have been challenged in other jurisdictions that have resulted in uh, multi-million dollar settlements and the court directed uh, the cities to approve the SB 35 projects. And the city council, based on uh, some of the feedback that uh, the city has received, has decided to reconsider its denial based on uh, some of the feedback based on whether the project can come into substantial compliance. And also something that is very important in this is that prior to the time that the 60-day approval window closed, the applicant submitted additional materials to resolve some of the issues and maybe all of the issues that were outstanding and the basis for the city council's decision to deny the project for non-compliance with objective <sighs> standards. And this motion to reconsider is um, to address those additional materials. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking to see if Samantha has any additional comments or Lee Butler on this item at all. I don't think we have any additional comments. I think Darcy uh, covered it pretty well, but we're available for any questions that you may have. Great, thank you, Darcy. Are there any questions right now from council members on this item? Council member Brown. Yeah, Th thank you. I actually, I have a few questions um, and I, I don't wanna get too far into the weeds because I know that uh, this will likely come back to us once some additional uh, analysis has been completed on the new information. But I have been in concerned about the application um, ele elements, certain elements, and one of them that I'm trying to get uh, clarity on is what the applicant um, is either has either stated, I believe, in the application to uh, the state for low-income housing tax credits, and also kind of you know, I think verbally or sort of less formally asserted um, is an expectation that the city will subsidize this project. Um, and, and so I know that that's sort of an ongoing conversation, but I'm specifically concerned with or interested in um, understanding the, um, the application i believe states and so I'm, i want to ask the question states does the the applicant's application state that the city will waive uh the fees the developer fees for this project and if so um, on what basis was that uh decision made and who and if it has not if it is not the case just if we could please clarify at what point that decision would be made and by whom Thanks, Councilmember Brown. I'll tackle that one. Um, the if if the developer were to request a waiver of permit fees um, for the affordable portions of the units, we do have a provision in the municipal code that allows for that request. It has been our practice to bring those requests to the city council. So those so such a request would come to the city council. They um, oftentimes come uh, um, after the fact. Uh, you know, after a project approval. Um, and so that could be a, a separate action. Um, to my knowledge, um, the applicant has included with um, some of the state um, uh, tax 
credit application materials um, with their pro forma analyses associated with those, um, indications that certain number of fees would be waived. Um, the, um, the city has not received a formal request to, to my knowledge, but I see Bonnie jumping on here, so maybe she has received something. <laughs> Um, and um, that that would be that would be a separate process. I, I will also say, you know, that is a discretionary process. I'm not aware of anything that mandates that the city waive those fees. And so, if that comes to the council, and, and the one other thing that I would say is that, um, to my knowledge, we have only done that as a city for 100% affordable projects, and we have not done that for anything less than 100% affordable projects. Um, and Thank Bonnie. you. If, if I could, I just so just to be clear, I'm, I wasn't asking to get a, you know, the, the background on the, the conversations that are happening around this and what might come to this council in the future. I just wanted to clarify whether or not the developer, the applicant had in fact stated that that was that those fees would be waived somewhere else in an application and um, and understand that that's in fact not um, something that would happen without council approval. So I'm, I'm good with that response. Bonnie, if you want to add something, feel free. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. And I, I would just add that um, in the sources and uses budget for the TCAC application, um, there is an assumption um, that uh, fees would be waived for the project. Although we have communicated with the developer, with the applicant, that that is subject to council approval, which would be in the future. So we have communicated that back. Great. I, I just wanted to clarify that today. Great. I'm just casting about here. No other questions at this point? Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and bring this out to public comment then. And uh, I'm going to take, it looks like we don't have anyone in the, in the chambers today, so that'll be easy. So I'll be on Zoom. First up, I'm going to take the folks with the um, extra three <coughs> minutes, and I will have you get ready to, um, so, I see your hands are up, which is great. Um, what, I'm gonna have 831 Responsible Development. And I have down that Guy Lanier is going to be the speaker on this. So go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, well, Mayor Myers and council members, on behalf of our citizens group 831 Responsible Development, and the 600 Santa Cruz residents who have signed our petition, not from Brentwood, not San Francisco, not Los Gatos, 600 Santa Cruz residents, we would like to express our gratitude in the spirit of Thanksgiving. Thank you for standing up for equity in building practices by saying no to segregated housing. Our city can say yes to affordable housing and to upholding local ordinances that require that economically attainable housing be dispersed and not segregated. Thank you for standing up for protecting the public health and safety of our community and for honoring health in all policies. And thank you for rightly declaring yourselves as the decision-making body for SB 35 projects. We acknowledge the unusual situation of 831 Water Street and the tricky timeline the city is subject to. We are now aware that substantial new material has been submitted since the October 12th public oversight meeting. As we have emphasized for nearly a year now, we would love to see affordable housing built on this site. And in that spirit, we support temporarily suspending council's denial of the current version of the application and extending the review timeline in alignment with the applicant's willingness to allow a December 14 public oversight meeting and a December 16 deadline for a final city council decision on the SB 35 application. Perhaps the applicant has corrected all of the many reasons for denial included in the city's October 14 letter. Perhaps affordable and equitable housing is now proposed for this project in a design that no longer poses potential threats to the public health and safety of its new residents and their surrounding community, and instead respects and honors the valid interests of all members of our community. <clears throat> Perhaps the project as described in the application's latest version also addresses the health, safety, slope, groundwater, and density bonus issues that were behind your decision to deny the last application. 
we are ready and willing to review the new materials from this place of hope. We stand behind and in support of the city's comprehensive October 14th letter to the applicant and thank the city council for your motion and vote. We encourage the city council, the city, to stand firmly on its principled position regarding the forced economic segregation promoted by this project's developer. Separate is inherently unequal, that's both common sense and settled law in this country. We extend our sincere thanks to staff for their detailed research and work substantiating council's vote and dealing with the applicant's many submissions. We hold out hope that a reasonable and responsible project can be built at 831 Water Street that will both help shelter our community and become something we can all be proud of. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Next, I'll have uh, Santa Cruz Yimby, and uh, I believe uh, Elizabeth Conlin is speaking for, for that group. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Elizabeth. I'm speaking today on behalf of Santa Cruz Yimby. Although the agenda item of the proposed apartment complex at 831 Water Street involves the city's compliance with state law and not the merits of the housing project, the reason why this housing law is important is because of our state's dire need for more homes. Many of our neighbors are experiencing rent burden, live in overcrowded conditions, and are struggling to get by in the third most expensive metropolitan region in California. This is not just a Santa Cruz problem, and because the problem is statewide, we need state action like the density bonus law to help fill the shortfall of over 10,000 affordable homes in this county. We need bills like SB 35, which streamlines affordable housing if cities and counties aren't reaching their goals because all cities need to be permitting affordable housing and delays make housing more expensive. While a dominant narrative on this housing project has been that the neighbors oppose it, we would like to elevate the voices of many Santa Cruz city and county community members who want these homes built. Recognizing that not everyone can take time in the middle of the day to provide comment, we want to amplify some from our petition in your agenda packet. Casey said, we can either keep complaining about houselessness and the astronomical cost of living, or we can act on it and develop new affordable housing like this project. Pete said, this project is exactly why SB 35 was written. Segregation isn't building two connected buildings with shared common areas. It's allowing wealthy neighbors and adjacent single family homes to kill apartment complexes. Ariel said, as a cyclist, I would love to live in a place like this. John bluntly said, I live close to the proposed development and though the architecture isn't great, I fully support the concept. Sibley said, we need more large housing projects near downtown in Santa Cruz. It is not surprising that people object. We've suppressed change in our built environment for decades in exchange for displacing people economically. We need to reverse that priority and that will be hard. Dan said, housing close to transportation and shopping also helps us reduce carbon emissions. Anjali said, it's time to walk our talk. We desperately need more housing, especially low income, high density housing. Supporting affordable housing at 831 Water Street is the right thing to do if we truly believe in diversity and inclusion. We understand that you and many in our community are upset about the loss of control over this project due to SB 35, but we were only eligible for an SB 35 project because our city is not building enough affordable housing. Members of council have a powerful opportunity to avoid fights like these in the future by championing more affordable housing in our city, approving more mixed income projects, continuing to work with nonprofit developers to build on city land and pursuing zoning reforms. Let's approve this project and begin the work of making Santa Cruz a housing leader. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Conlon. <clears throat> Next up, I have Santa Cruz to Mark and Lyra Filippini is here to speak on that. Hi, thank you. Lyra Filippini representing Santa Cruz tomorrow. We support your October 12th denial as substantiated including disqualification of the density bonus, safety issues with the structure's proximity to the slope, and the segregation of the affordable units from the market rate units. It's unfortunate that new materials submitted by the applicant and a letter from HCD would trigger a possible rescinding of your vote instead of treated as a new application. We haven't had the time to review all the new materials, but we have read HCD's letter and feel it has been misrepresented in the local papers. What the letter does say is that they support the development of housing, including this project. After all, this is the task they were given by the state, so their support of the project is no surprise. 
Of the denial reasons they were wonderfully, that were wonderfully substantiated in Lee Butler's letter, HCD only mentions the segregation, and what is included in HCD's letter versus what is completely admitted is notable. Out of the nine anti-segregation laws included in the city's denial letter, HCD chose only to voice their opinion on AB 491, saying it is new and not yet in effect. However, AB 491 makes clear that it is not a new law, but merely clarification of existing law. There's a lot more on that, but the point here is that HCD did not weigh in on denial based on the other segregation laws. And I'll add that none of the SB 35 legal cases lost by cities included segregation as a basis for denial. So hopefully soon we will adopt a policy around the SB 35 timeline like San Francisco's in which the city's letter to the applicant would have ended that timeline cycle and the new material submission would start another one. But under the new legislative pressure, we understand you may choose to rescind the denial of the project itself and extend the timeline so the new application can be reviewed. After all, we do have a housing affordability crisis and there's a chance the new application materials correct all of the issues. As we continue this process, it's incredibly important that the council stand behind the decision to be the approval body for SB 35 projects. This was publicly said at a meeting that was specifically about SB 35 in Santa Cruz. Yes, it creates stressful and hard decisions, but the most crucial decisions are often difficult. We trust you, our elected representatives, to exercise the power and responsibility given to you by the California Constitution. This includes the ability for you to be the oversight body for SB 35 applications. With you in this role, the public can provide substantiated input on an application's qualification for SB 35, as well as adherence to the objective standards. If staff were to become the decision-making body, it would be like a prosecutor also being a judge and evidence found by others may not be equally considered. The bias that comes with their role is totally understandable. The planning and development staff are excellent at their job to facilitate development, and we do need them. But we elect you to represent us. We elect you to protect us. And we elect you to ensure our infrastructure, resources, and carrying capacity are managed so that we may have an equitable and sustainable city. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, next we'll go ahead and uh, queue up the folks who are here to also speak on this item. You'll be given one minute. And um, first I'll take Rafa Sonnenfeld. And uh, go, ahead. go ahead, Rafa. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, council members. Um, I'm glad we're here again looking at the possibility of approving E31 Water Street. I just want to say that this whole ordeal is embarrassing. It's embarrassing that you've already tried to deny the project on specious grounds. It's embarrassing that I've had to threaten to sue my own city for denying a project you're legally required to approve. It's embarrassing the mayor just wrote an op-ed that ignores the science and the recommendations from the experts of the county about the primary cause of homelessness, which is the lack of access to affordable housing. It's embarrassing that the state's uh, Department of so uh, Housing Department is on social media dunking on our city on Twitter for having denied this project once. The project's a density bonus project that's entitled to waive virtually every objective standard you can try to come up with to block it. Stop lying to yourselves in the public when you say that you are powerless as a city to address the underlying causes of homelessness. The most powerful thing you can do to end homelessness is to approve more housing now. Stop this charade and do something that actually addresses the primary cause of homelessness. Rescind the denial letter and approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kyle Kelly. Hey, thank you so much. Oh, is it working there? Yep, we can hear you, Kyle. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I always feel bad when people start the meeting. I, I'll make mine quick, especially <sighs> since I kind of fumbled the intro here. I uh, just want to call to support the project, support rescinding the, the previous denial of the project. I, I'd like to move forward um, and, and see these homes get built. This is, it's great to see. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Sue Terrence. Hello. We can hear I, you. I would like to um, appreciate the position you're in, the position we're all in. We need affordable housing. We don't need it at this scale and density on this less than an acre piece of property at a very dangerous and busy intersection. I appreciate that you have the responsibility 
to one, provide that affordable housing, and two, provide a safe, responsible development that will not cause irreparable harm to our neighborhoods. So I would like to work with Mr. Novin, with you, to say, how do we come to a, an agreement about housing that is affordable and safe? Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Brooke uh, Madison. Hello there. Um, once again, I appreciate your thoughtful and patient considerations of this complex issue. I know this is really hard on all of you. Um, please remember, historically, there are good laws and sometimes ill-conceived laws hurriedly enacted that could endanger public safety. And I heartily encourage you to fight the good fight to ensure all of our safety. Just because there are new laws are pressuring you to fast track developments like this doesn't mean they are safe or right, nor does it mean they are, will withstand the test of time or be equitable. Respectfully, I submit whatever happens on this site that might endanger public safety or be inequitable will be there for a long time and we and you will have to live with what you allow. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, I have Simon Gorbani. Hello. Um, I suppose whilst it was stated that it was embarrassing that the uh, council Turn, turn down the uh, application and it was embarrassing that someone should have to sue the city. Um, first of all, I think it's kind of embarrassing that someone that drapes themselves in the flag of um, kind of solutions to social problems would then go and sue a city. For its, I think that's kind of perverse. Um, and secondly, there have been lots of, I'm from England and they, they, there were lots of attempts to kind of address um, housing problems in the past. And they actually have now looked back at them, um, kind of trying to fix a pocket watch with a sledgehammer and building upwards as a quick solution. And now they look back on a lot of those things and see them as embarrassing. Um, so all I'm saying is that, that just because there is a law right now, it doesn't mean that in five years time, people aren't gonna look. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public at this time who would like to speak to this item? I have Sabina. Hello, uh, I just wanna call in and give my support for 831 Water. We do need housing at this scale and density and we need more buildings at this scale and density. Um, your previous vote, you broke the law and you know that you broke the law and that's why you're getting sued. It's time to admit that you guys were wrong and to make sure this project can move forward. This council repeatedly makes votes to end up getting the city sued. Please stop wasting our money on legal fees. Just build housing. You know that we need housing. Just please just admit you were wrong for once. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any other members of the public at this time who would like to speak to item number 18, which is consider a motion to rescind the City Council's October 12th, 2021 denial of the 831 Water Street Development Project. I see, Simon, you just spoke. I see your hands up. Um, so I can't have you go again, technically. Um, anybody else out there with their hand up? Jim Burns, go ahead, please. Press star six, Jim, to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, thank you very much. The Yimby response coming from a number of people on their petition who have no stake in what happens in Santa Cruz because they don't live here is so typical of the messaging from people in support of this outlandish and dangerous project. Their response always is framed to suggest that the citizens of our city don't want aff affordable housing on this site. Not true. We want it right there at 831 Water Street, just not at a scale that overwhelms an entire area of our city in a manner that creates too many health and safety issues to mention. 
Their response always suggests that Novin's project is perfect as it is. We all know it isn't, as you and you have, uh, as you rightly know. In closing, permit me to say that compromise is a word that almost never gets used these days, but there's plenty of room for it here. One that provides affordable housing but doesn't create the need for segregated and illegal housing. Thanks. One that provides affordable housing but doesn't um, create a god-awful number of health and safety issues. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time. Thank you. Next, I have Zenon Ule, Ule Crow, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Zenon Ulye Crow. I'm a first year politics major at uh, UC Santa Cruz, and I'm really excited to be joining the community this year. Um, and I just wanted to voice my support for 831 Water Street. Um, I think it's a tough decision. I understand the pressure a lot of you guys are under, and I know it can be a tough vote, especially when you know you feel like you're having a lot of pressure being weighed down on you. But we know that per capita, living in cities is the greenest way we can live. Per capita, our urban areas are the greenest places on the planet. And in order to move forward to make sure that, you know, if we can continue to live as a generation, it requires building closer together. It requires having this affordable housing and, you know, making sure that you know, we give people the opportunity to live where they work. So I really implore you guys to go ahead and approve this project, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Anybody, I see Andrew Barber have, has his hand up. Go ahead, please. Hello, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm out of town and I've been trying to follow this meeting. Um, and I just, I don't have any prepared comments, but I want to say uh, as someone who has lived in this area for a few years, I'm a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz. Um, my fiance and I live uh, 141 Catalpa Street, so very close to this development. And I was so excited to hear that this project was being proposed. I thought it was so important to have more housing in the area. Uh, as someone who is you know, making a very small salary at the university as a teaching assistant, um, anything that has the potential to reduce the cost of housing uh, is extremely important. And I think it's important to hear from, from you know, families that are, that are being pushed out of the city. I mean, my fiance and I, unless housing prices are, are going to decrease in the next few years, we're gonna be forced elsewhere. And I think that's gotta be tough. I mean, the city probably, I would assume, wants young families uh, to be willing to move there and to have the capacity to handle those young families. And I mean, I just want you to know as, you know, as a, a couple that's just starting out, I, I, I don't see a future for us in Santa Cruz if the price of housing is not um, gotten under control. And I, and I do think these developments okay. are going to have an effect on the margin thank and you. in aggregate thank if you. more yeah, developments get proposed. Thank, thank you very much. Next I have uh, phone number ending in 808, I'm sorry, 1535. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're, you're very light, though. If you could speak a little louder. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the council. Mayor Myers, on behalf of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, please consider rescinding the denial of 831 Water Street and direct staff to complete the Senate Bill 35 Injective Standards Consistency Review in light of the additional materials provided by the applicant to essentially comply with the city's objective zoning, subdivision, and design standards. Now more than ever, we need our leaders to reinstate their commitment to pro-affordable housing goals and to create a more streamlined approval process for SB 35 applications going forward. This is an unprecedented opportunity for the city to really set an example for the rest of the region. Cities should be leveraging new state tools and legislation and begin updating their objective standards to prepare for an uptick of SB 35 projects going forward. Thanks again for um, doing your due diligence and working directly with staff to make the right decision. Thank you. Is there any other attendees in the audience that would like to speak to this item? Uh, Emily Ham is up next. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Emily. I'm the executive director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council, and I will make my remarks very short, um, as you've already seen um, our commentary and various forms, but I wanted to reiterate our um, 
our support for the project and also uh, urge you to rescind your decision. And uh, we also thank you for your due diligence and we realize this is a tough decision. So thank you very much for working, um, working with the community on this one. Thank you. Next I have Cap Pennell. There you go. Yeah, thank you. I wonder what is this development process really? It's like whack-a-mole. Fiddling with timelines and deadlines is really not good civics. Your council denied the application for good cause. Now the proponents want to act as though that didn't matter at all. Shorting the timelines on the front end and extending them beyond practical limits on the back end is not worthy of height and slope variances Density bonuses are lot splits for quick sale. What's the profit is there? What does the project application say? It's changed. What is the objective standard, by the way, for the weight of a fully laden firefighting water tender driving across the roof of a parking garage? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other attendees today that would like to speak to this item? Please raise your hand by pressing star nine at this point. Okay, I think we are at the end of public comment then. Um, I will go ahead and bring this back to council. So for those of the members of the public, we're on item number 18. Um, and I'll bring it back for council deliberation at this time. Any other comments or questions of Council Member Cummings? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to the members of the public. This is a very controversial item. And um, yeah, and so it's, you know, this is a very challenging issue for us to address today. Um, I have a pretty long set of comments, but I'm just gonna get it all out in one swoop um, because uh, I wanted to touch on <coughs> our decision to deny the, applica the application our role as decision makers under SB 35, and then the distribution of the affordable units. So the only issue before the council today is whether it is justified to reverse the decision we made on October 14th to deny the project application. <clears throat> the application for this project was revised at least twice before the council acted on October 14th. The application is now again asking to, the applicant is now again asking to revise the application. In addition to this, uh, the letters from the applicant's attorney continue to propose revisions. One letter indicates that the applicant is withdrawing the density bonus request to provide all the affordable units in one building. <clears throat> a subsequent letter indicates that the applicant wants to reinsert uh, that density bonus waiver. And it's unfair to the public and undermines the integrity of the planning process to allow continual revisions to an application, especially after a decision on the project has already been made. Nothing prevents the applicant from resubmitting an application for the project Public policy decisions should not be made on the basis of threat of a lawsuit. The council acted reasonably and legally in denying the application on October 14th. If the applicant has new information, the traditional and appropriate way to provide it is through a new application. In terms of the second part of the motion, this application is the first SB 35 application the city has received. Since CEQA does not apply to SB 35 projects, the city's normal environmental review does not occur. To assist with project financing, SB 35 projects are likely to apply to the, the County Housing Authority for federally funded Section 8 project-based vouchers. The city is the agency that will carry out the required environmental review of these applications under the National Environmental Policy Act, and it's critical that the Council play a central role in the NEPA process to ensure adequate public participation. As far as our role as SB 35 decision makers, state law clearly designates the City Council as an appropriate body to conduct the public oversight hearing and approve SB 35 projects. Section 65913.14C, any design review or public oversight of the development may be conducted by the Local Government's Planning Commission or an equivalent board of com or commission responsible for review and approval of development projects or the City Council or Board of Supervisors as appropriate." End quote. Council members are elected by the community to represent the community's interests and we have a responsibility to make the tough decisions and not hide behind our staff. Our council faces complex issues all the time, such as homelessness, water supply, budgeting. Those are just a few examples. We turn to our staff for guidance and advice, but in the end, it's our job to make the difficult policy decisions. 
should not shirk our responsibilities with this project because the law and the issues are complex. It's our job and it's what the people elected us to do. So I strongly uh, oppose designating the staff to make decisions that the public wants and expects us as a, as a governing body to make. Uh, with regards to affordable housing and the distribution of these units throughout the project, SB 35 clearly allows the city to require consistency of projects within its reasonable objective standards. Of the, from the density bonus law, uh, section 65913.4.C, quote, uh, that design review or public oversight shall be objective and be strictly focused on assessing compliance with the criteria required for streamlined projects, as well as any reasonable objective design standard, end quote. The inclusionary ordinance requirement that affordable units be distributed throughout a project has been uniformly applied to projects in the past and is a reasonable, and is a reasonable standard. There is nothing in the law that eliminates the standard based on the financing of the project. Staff and the applicant argue that the HCD guidelines permit the project to concentrate all the affordable units in one building. However, the HCD guidelines are somewhat contradictory but allow the city council to use the inclusionary ordinance as a guide. Section 402E states absolutely that, quote, if the locality has an adopted inclusionary ordinance, the objective standards contained in that ordinance apply to the development under the streamlined ministerial approval process. Section 402F states, as staff says, that affordable units shall be distributed throughout the development unless otherwise necessary for state or local funding programs. Section 402F is a state requirement imposed by HCD guidelines on SB 35 projects in jurisdictions that don't have inclusionary ordinances. Section 402E applies to jurisdictions with inclusionary ordinances and makes clear that in these circumstances, the provisions of the inclusionary ordinance would apply. Furthermore, the language in SB 35 providing for HCD guidelines does not seem intended to undermine the objective standards of a local jurisdiction. Under that ordinance, uh, under that law, Section 65913.4i, the department may review, adopt, amend, and repeal guidelines to implement uniform standards or criteria that supplement or clarify the terms, references, or standards set forth in this section. End quote. The HCD guidelines related to funding sources, if applied, would not supplement or clarify the objective standards in the city's inclusionary ordinance. The guidelines would negate these standards, which is not consistent with the law. And so, um, Based on this information, I would also just like to point out what was brought to our attention today was that um, one of the things that was highlighted as a result of Councilmember Brown's question was that the applicant is also, has also been acting in bad faith by submitting an application for financing under the assumption that the city will provide waivers for the affordable housing units when this hasn't come to our attention. And it's also unclear whether in other jurisdictions that were sued, whether the applicants had, had this level of revisions to their projects applications. And so with this information and for the comments that I've uh, provided, I would like to move, and I sent this motion over to the clerk so that people can see it, that the city take the following action, that we decline to rescind its, its previous decision denying the 831 Water Street application and direct staff to place an agenda item on the December 14th meeting agenda regarding the city council's role in any NEPA review process for SB 35 projects. Second. And I have comments when I have, when I get the opportunity to speak. Okay, we have a motion on the table um, that is, includes these two items and is second by council member Brown and I'll go ahead and um, have council member Brown make her comments. Thank you. Uh, so I, um, I have I had written some comments that had some similarities to Councilmember Cummings' comments, and I won't repeat those. Um, but I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I want to just highlight two things here. The first is um, SB 35 does not, from as far as I understand, entitle uh, applicants to submit. Uh, ongoing documents that are internally contradictory, which is what I have found in my, at least in my read of the, the documents that have been coming our way, kind of fast and furious um, in response to our last action. Um, we have, um, I believe, uh, met our obligations under SB 35 to give the developer an opportunity 
to um, provide evidence that this project would meet objective standards. Our staff has done a phenomenal amount of work um, to to help us try to understand this. To work, you know, this is new for them as well. And I just want to. I mean, I cannot thank our staff enough for all of the work that's gone into this. And I do not think it's fair to continually um, be asking them to um, to respond to whatever the, the next thing is that the applicant decides might you know, be useful for the conversation. It's not, it's not good governance to, to do things this way. I think a, a member of the public suggested that. I believe that at this point, the applicant should submit a revised new application, trigger the new timeline, and let us do our job and let the staff do their job in reviewing a complete and a and an application that is not internally contradictory and asking for different things. Um, and you know, we just, it was like, we don't even know it's a moving target and assessing a moving target like that is very difficult. Um, these are decisions that are gonna affect our community. And I think we have a responsibility to um, play a role in this. Um, I believe the developer should be submitting a new application. And um, so I'm gonna support this motion. Uh, today and um, I think that would open the door for the developer to reevaluate, take the materials that have been coming our way, give us a clear and consistent application and um, we can go from there. Thank you, council member. Um, Bonnie, can you put that up maybe one more time? And uh, just a reminder for council members to try to speak as loudly as possible. I've gotten a few, Absolutely. a few, uh, I think you were fine, but just sometimes I get a little email from folks. so. Um, Okay, uh, is there any other questions or comments uh, on the motion? I just wanna be able to have it up so folks can can respond. Council Member Kalantar Johnson. Um, yes, this is, this is a very difficult decision and difficult project for us and, and um, the comments from the members of the public who wrote and who spoke up uh, can demonstrate that. Um, what I heard from members of the public and what I saw in the email correspondence is the opportunity to review the materials that have come before us. I think I, I tried to take notes as members of the public were speaking. I believe 14 people spoke and all but one uh, agreed that we should look at the additional materials that have come our way and that's consistent with all the letters that we've received. Uh, my understanding is that the additional materials were brought forward to us within the time period that was allotted. And I agree with my colleagues here, Councilmember Cummings and Councilmember Brown, that it was, it's been difficult to try to track everything that's come our way and feels like a little bit of a ping pong table. Uh, but if the materials were given to us in the allotted time slot, and we're clearly hearing from the public that we should review these additional materials that may may not, but may have addressed a lot of our concerns, I would like to give that opportunity. So I will not be supporting the motion. Okay. Any other council members? Uh, I just have a question um, on, the, on the item number two, um, I guess for Tony. Um, it says, regarding the city council's role in any NEPA review process for SB 35 projects, where, I'm just curious about NEPA's role in this. Is that, would that come in because there may be federal funding that makes that nexus or so, where is that nexus? Because NEPA, I know just from the nightmare of dealing with NEPA all the time, that there has to be a federal nexus. So there has to either be a federal permit, federal funding, what have you? So my understanding is that the federal nexus is the application for Section 8 Section vouchers. Eight. Okay. Um, but I would note that that is a separate process. It's not part of this application. So they would need to comply with NEPA in order to secure uh, an agreement with, um, I, I suppose, the county, the county uh, housing, authority. housing department uh, for, for Section 8 vouchers. So I'm just, so the NEPA review would be done by the County Housing Authority then? Uh, my understanding is that the city would do it. Okay, got it. But um, again, it would be a separate process from, from this application. 
Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions from council members on this at all? No? You're good. Okay. Um, okay, then um, we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote uh, on this motion. Uh, the motion's made by council member Cummings and seconded by council member uh, Brown. And uh, Bonnie, why don't we go ahead and do a roll call vote? Council member Watkins is absent. Valentine Johnson? No. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? No. Vice Mayor Bruner? No. Mayor Myers? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a no on this too. And I just, just also for the record, um, I really wanna be able to look at the additional materials that are gonna be provided. Um, and I definitely look forward to the December 14th meeting uh, where we can continue uh, discussing this. Um, and so my no is based on, on that interest in new materials and continuing, um, continuing to the December 14th for that discussion. Okay. Um, we will go ahead and move on to- Do you need a motion at all or no? What? Do you need action taken? You, need, you have to take you need, that uh, You need another motion, right? The motion, that's the staff motion, is not, that's, yeah. if you didn't do that one, you have to do something else. Oh, you're right, sorry. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. The, the glass box is, is kind of <laughs> distracting me. Okay, so that motion fails, and so we will have to come back, and I would look to a motion for, um, on the floor for, for this item. Council member Golder. Okay, I'd like to make a motion, um, as it's written in the packet, consider rescinding the decision to deny the A31 Water Street project and direct staff to review the additional materials provided by the applicant to determine if the project can be brought into substantial compliance with the city's objective zoning, subdivide, subdivision, and design standards to consider the scheduling the scheduling follow-up follow public oversight hearing at the um, December 14th city council meeting and three direct staff to complete the Senate Bill 35 objective standards consistency review in light of the new information. I have a comment, if I could. Um, the recommended action was that the council consider taking this, these actions. The motion should be to rescind the decision, schedule the follow-up public oversight meeting, and direct staff. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Tony. That's what... <laughs> okay. And Vice Mayor Bruner? I was going to second. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion to rescind the decision, schedule a follow-up public oversight hearing on December 14th at the city, at the December 14th, 2021 city council member meeting, excuse me, and then direct staff to complete the Senate Bill uh, 35 uh, review, objective standards consistency review. Uh, go ahead, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Did I capture okay. that correctly, Tony? Okay, That's thank right. you. Council Member Cummings. I just had one question on um, item number three, which is direct staff to complete the Senate bill, SB 35 objectives, objective standards consistency review. Um, is that for all subsequent SB 35 projects? Or is that just for this project? Because I know we had direction at other meetings that city council would be that um, objective standard uh, review committee. Um, this is not uh, intended to change any existing council policy. Um, the council would still conduct the public oversight hearing at its four December 14th meeting, but the staff would uh, complete the objective standards analysis and present it to the council at that time. Thank you, council member. Uh, just to confirm this sort of this uh, review of this project relate, related to the new information, right? So it's a clarification. It's not in any way affect anything else that might come. Great, thank you. Council Member Brown. Yeah, I, I just want to make a comment that I um, I understand the move, the move that um, is being made here, and I um, I too look forward to looking at the new information. Um, I just believe that that should come to us in a, a new application, given the kind of the course that this has taken. So. I just wanted to be clear about that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Councilmember Watkins is absent. 
Ellen Terry Johnson? Aye. <clears throat> Brown? No. Cummings? No. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes four in favor and two against. Okay. Uh, we will move on to item number 19 now. This is a proposal to create a city ad hoc committee for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. If you are planning to speak, you're going to want to press star nine on your phone. Um, we're going to make a few comments. The three council members who brought this forward will make a, a very, very short um, presentation, not presentation, but just make some comments. Um, and then I'm going to take it out to see if there's questions from, com uh, from council members, and then we'll bring it out to um, public comments. So if you do want to comment, please go ahead and get yourself uh, in the queue for that. Uh, this is uh, a proposal to create a city council ad hoc committee charged to investigate and provide the full council direction whether to establish an at-large directly elected mayor, direction regarding establishment of future primary or general election timelines and or consideration of ranked choice voting within potential council districts, and three, advise the council on other matters related to the city charter as they relate to the implementation of, a, of a bi-district voting-based structure. Um, I guess I can, I'll start this off and I'll look to Council Member Watkins is not here today, but uh, Council Member Golder, if she has any um, additions to just a brief discussion of this item. We brought this item forward um, <coughs> primarily at, uh, after, again, looking through um, really a, a massive, really a, a monumental change that's ahead of us due to the California Voting Rights Act. Um, we as a council have been deliberating on this item for, gosh, almost I think two years now when we first received the lawsuit um, that we were out of compliance with the California Voters Rights Act. Um, for the public, many communities throughout California are under the similar um, uh, legal uh, litigation by the by, primarily uh, uh, one one uh, one one law firm primarily, but with um, members of their communities signing on to to complete this this litigation to have cities in California more uh, really consider representation based on. Um, the demographics of the census um, and have those demographics represented on the city councils for those towns. Um, we have initiated this through um, our process of going towards this um, district election through a settlement agreement that was completed with the litigants um, and we have established a timeline and a process to complete this work uh, with the idea of um, having um, seven districts draw a uh, seven district uh, proposal for the city council to move forward with, and I believe, remind me, uh, city manager uh, Rosemary Menard, um, I believe by March or April, correct? Uh, yes, that's right. To to make a decision, so on the maps and the districts, so that they could people who might be interested in running for the various vacancies would have information that they needed. So this process has been underway, thank you, um, for a number of months. We've held a, f a number of city council meetings as well as we've um, initiated, um, I think, at least three public meetings on this, um, one of which was an actual public hearing held concurrent with city council meeting. And we, the three members that brought this forward, um, in addition to those uh, outreach, we've also heard uh, personally from uh, various m members of our community to um, investigate um, the other matters that may come along with the district. Uh, one being um, looking at and um, bringing forward to this council uh, an analysis at, of what an at-large directly elected mayor may look like for, for this community. Um, secondly is looking at how will our uh, district elections sort of be um, be governed um, as they move forward, um, and one of the I, one of the, a couple of different things have been brought forward. 
uh, in motion, in actually uh, comments by the council as well as the community. Uh, one is looking at the use of primaries um, potentially in the um, process of looking at district elections. The other uh, mentioned several months ago when we had a public hearing was ranked choice voting. Um, and that's another thing that could be looked at by this ad hoc committee. And then finally, the third um, would be to look at um, the actual city charter revisions that would be necessary um, to actually look at a possible recommendation on those two items I just mentioned, as well as um, uh, the, the basic premise of implementing the bi-district voting um, base structure. So we feel that the public process is important. The dem demographer is doing the work. We also feel like there's, there's a time uh, sensitive things where we don't wanna be working as a community and adjusting our election process over several election cycles and over multiple years. So um, we're bringing this forward today to just get support hopefully to do a process also to look at these other questions and then actually bring back something as quickly as the first meeting in January if we can, so that we, our council um, colleagues can have these conversations um, sooner rather than later, because these are questions that are out in the community right now. Um, I know we received some uh, communications from the community, um, and I think we all sit in probably a little bit of the same place in terms of being forced to go to districts and whether that's gonna be a good thing or a bad thing for Santa Cruz. Um, but the fact is, and Tony can mention this, um, again, we're up against this decision with not a lot of um, good legal basis to, to mount a fight against it, um, at least one that's been successful in any other city, and that can come with quite a bit of cost into the, you know, possibly in, even into the millions in trying to fight some of these, to fight this um, process. So, that's really the intent of this, is to, to put a set of people together, do this work rather quickly, uh, and get you some materials um, for our colleagues to continue to discuss, so that we have this, this, this kind of discussion concurrent with the districts that are being drawn and managed through the demographer-based, through the demographer-led process, which is really um, what needs to be done to get to the districts for 2022. Tony, I don't know if you have anything to add in terms of all of that, but you've tracked on some of this, and I know we've had a conversation about this item, so I thought I'd see if you had anything to add. No, that, that sums it up very well. Um, happy to answer any questions or, or respond to comments <laughs> of council members. And I'd just add that uh, Deputy City Attorney Cassie Bronson has been working uh, a lot on these uh, district elections matters, and she's also available to answer questions from the Great. council. Great, thank you. Thanks, Cassie, for being here. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions on the item. Yeah, Councilman Brown. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the intention here, um, and I do recognize that there are a lot of questions circulating in the community <laughs> about um, what this is going to mean, and um, we have a relatively constrained process specifically related to the districting because this was initiated through um, uh, um, a uh, potential legal challenge, I'll just say that. <laughs> I'm trying to be polite <laughs> about that, how this came before us. Um, I guess I, um, and, and, you know, and, and we it, it previously had intended to have a more thorough community conversation. A charter review committee was established and uh, members of the community were appointed to that, uh, that committee. Um, that work was curtailed. Um, unfortunately, we have not since that time uh, reinvigorated uh, that, that body or tried to reestablish some kind of space to have this, this conversation. And so I, I, I worry about um, the short turnaround time. I guess I'm wondering what you all thought about that given the, um, I mean, these are really, really fundamental issues. And if we want to make a decision to perhaps put something on the ballot for a charter amendment, um, it's very difficult to envision doing that in, you know, having one, maybe two conversations at the city council um, without some additional work and community engagement. So I guess I'm just wondering how you see um, this work getting us to a place where we will, could, 
could make those kinds of decisions in a very, um, you know, a quick turnaround. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just. I saw Rosemary lean nervous. forward. Um, yeah, I, I think what we envisioned, um, we we've done some some research. There's a number of cities who are sort of in the same boat we are, and several that are a little bit ahead of us. So we've looked at charter amendments that have been brought forward and voted on. Some have been successful, some of them haven't. Um, we've also just looked at how um, communities have assessed, uh, you know, whether or not a directly elected at large mayor um, is something, you know, that people need to look at. What are the duties of that? I mean, there's a lot of questions on that. So I think really what the intent of our ad hoc committee, and I'll look to Council Member Golder, is um, our community, you know, also has expressed some members that at least I've talked to is, you know, that, that this can be disruptive to have your sort of election process in flux over several cycles. And so I think our intent is to utilize some of the work that's been done in other cities, working with Tony and Cassie to, you know, look at charter, a charter amendment language that we can bring back to you sooner than rather than later. Um, you know, explore uh, the primary piece to it, kind of put in writing some of these other questions that are out there, do some work around those, and come with some uh, discussion, um, really some discussion proposals, um, rather than sort of putting all of this on the back burner. Um, and that's really, I think, the intent is that, um, you know, we don't, you know, we don't sort of try to do this um, two, three, you know, two, three election cycles from now, because I think we did learn that most communities, if they're going to, to make changes in their districts, you know, you try to do your package as quickly and as closely integrated as possible. Otherwise, it gets very confusing to the public. You know, if you go from, you know, my, you know seven to six or what have it, you know, Plus, I think we also want to um, have a conversation with you all in transparently in front of our constituents about, um, you know, what this is really going to mean. And if, if you did have a directly elected mayor, what would, how would the council need to operate in that kind of setting? You know, because even though that might be a directly elected at large uh, position or, you know, elected position, um, without the rest of those colleagues, you know, you're not going to get a lot done as just the, the mayor. So you know, really helping us have some conversations around the dynamics of what our governance looks like into the future. And so, you know, it's hard to do that in a compressed um, time frame. but as you know, we've had a lot going on this year. And um, I think it's just an expression to try to catch up to the process around the seven districts, which has been a little intangible and not super available to folks. Absolutely. Um, so. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Sure, and okay. then I'll go Thanks. to Council Member Golden. Uh, or did, did you want to respond? I, well, I just wanted, I, I mean, I just wanted to say that I think in closed session, all of us agreed that we didn't like how we got where we are. Like, we, we don't like being threatened, and we didn't like that we were having to only talk about it behind closed doors. And so I think the fact that we can open it up and um, putting it on the agenda and having updates from um, the committee, I mean, other than the, the options that we put on there, I didn't see a whole heck of a lot of choice. And so... I think, um, and, and I'm not alone, and a concern that if we just went to seven council members, there'd be factions in the city and things we know, it would be, you know, very divisive. So, I mean, I think we all, we've talked about that the idea, this idea of a charter amendment to, um, to elect a, an at-large mayor would help um, in, in unification of the council moving forward with this different system that we're not accustomed to. And so... Um, I think that with everything that we've been working on, this kind of has been put to the back burner. And honestly, I haven't thought about it unless it's been brought up in closed session packets. But like the bottom line is the clock is ticking <laughs> and we're gonna have to get there. And so I would just like for us to be able to take some control as a as a as a governing body to to make those decisions. Um, you know, and, and that that was kind of our conversation. Thanks. I, I do have a follow-up. Um, I, I guess I'll just, in response to that, I just want to say I, I just wish this had come to us much sooner, and I recognize that we've been busy, um, but I felt like the general tenor of our conversations have been, well, we just aren't going to be able to deal with that, and so I was going along with that, um, kind of what seemed to be the 
um, general will of the council and city leadership, and so it's just a little frustrating to now um, get it without a lot of time to kind of work through what you know, what information will be collected, who's going to be weighing in, and all of that. It's just, it's it's a bummer, but um, we are where we are. Um, my follow-up question, and I, you know, I'm, I want to. I'm, I'm asking this, you know, I, I, my questions about community engagement seem to be triggering um, res strong responses. And so I want to be really clear that I really just want to know, um, in terms of your work, um, is the intention to um, make, create space that's available for members of the community to speak with you? And how will that happen? And, you know, are you doing targeted outreach or will they be advertised if you're going to have meetings? And, you know, just some of that about the process would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would like to comment real quick, and Renee can jump in too, um, a little bit on your frustration about, I shared the same frustration, and I think what we've, what we've found in the last, you know, few months is, um, you know, staff leadership that has said, yes, let's ask this question, frankly. Um, and so, you know, I think um, we were all a little bit frustrated about how we were gonna do the process and um, it, there was not a lot of, it was a very strict process that was presented to us, sort of, a, sort of a cookie cutter, sort of this is how you do it, this is how we get to the finish line, and then we'll figure, we'll fi figure everything else afterward. And so I think, I guess for me, I wasn't really comfortable with that, and I did wanna try to like, you know, kind of push, kind of try to push a little bit to get more communication and more discussion with the community. Um, if we get approval to do the ad hoc committee, we certainly will, you know, come back uh, as a committee and try to, you know, try to operationalize something pretty quickly. And, um, uh, you know, clock is ticking, but we would, um, I would anticipate, and I think we've all anticipated um, as much outreach as possible. Obviously, we wanna have something for people to, 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 uh, to work with. So um, not speaking too much in generalities, but really looking at specifics, looking at maybe what other cities have done. Um, and then, you know, really pulling on different groups and organizations that we can access as quickly as possible. I know Democratic Women's Club, for example, just did a session on this. So looking at, you know, at, um, you know, the other Democratic clubs in town, you know, the DC, you know, wherever, wherever we can get that, that access to with these discussions, um, I think is our intent as, to the extent that we can. Um, and uh, it's a tight timeline and it'll be, but again, we may come to the, to the conclusion, we can't move this fast, we need more time, or we may get there. And as a council, feel comfortable with putting something on the, for, you know, on the, on the ballot for the, for the voters to think about. They, get, they, again, they again then just kind of become part of the process and you know, in, in taking another step on this impor important governance um, question. So that that's kind of what I see happening. I don't know, Council Member Golder, and yeah, Council Member. Yeah, I'll, I'll no, I didn't have anything. I was pointing to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I guess. And first, I want to thank you all for bringing this forward, and I also share kind of some of the frustration that was expressed because I I felt like earlier this year when we were having these discussions, it, the intent was to kind of you know focus on as Council Member Brown said, you know. If we try to focus on all three of these at the same time, it could be a bit overwhelming for people. And so, you know, we really wanted to focus on the district elections. Um, and I totally get, because I've had these questions and them come to me about, so what are we going to do about the mayor? Is it going to rotate? Is it not? You know, do we have two council members or per district? Do we have one? Um, and, and so, um, you know, trying, trying to focus that conversation just on the districts made sense, but I also understand that, you know, there's a lot of other questions out there. Um, and yeah, it seemed like you know previously, um, you know we some of the recommendations we had received were to try to kind of move one piece at a time, um, and now it's you know there's rationale behind why we need to do maybe more of this at the same time. I am I, I will share that I'm pretty concerned, and maybe I'll ask a couple questions to see if I can get some clarification. Um, one is I'm wondering and. This doesn't have to come to us today, but I'm wondering, I know that when, um, during the first community meeting uh, that Ralph had put on regarding district elections with the community, I think these two topics were brought up. I mean, my, my understanding was that they were going to be discussed briefly at that meeting. They weren't, they weren't going to go into very 
much detail, but I'm just wondering if there if that happened, and if so, if there's any kind of comments we might be able to get from what came out of that meeting. I am thinking you're re making a reference to the September 18th meeting. Is that correct? The public hearing that happened. There was, was a there was a council setting, and then there was a follow up. I think in late August, um, and then. So my recollection of that um, meeting, which I intended either, I think I intended all of it, but frankly, I don't remember at this point, um, uh, was it w was that it wasn't very well attended and it was, and this issue did not come up in any substantive way. That's my recollection. Um, you know, I can, I can jump in here. Uh, Rosemary, it's, yep, hi, it's Cassie. Cassie. Um, hi, I, I think I was at that meeting and it was before the actual public hearings. Um, there was sort of a less formal meeting um, that I did with Ralph uh, DeMarquette, um, that where some of these ideas were sort of discussed. And it was mostly um, an educational opportunity for a lot of the public and, uh, you know, sort of explain some of these concepts to them. It appeared to me that most of the comments were along the lines of like, do we really have to go to district elections? And so, sort of that, those sorts of comments and questions rather than sort of getting into the intricacies of, you know, how many people feel really strongly about the, um, the directly elected mayor, for example. Um, but I think it was actually a really nice educational opportunity for the public and those members of the public who did attend to sort of asked me questions about the legalities and uh, Ralph was there too. Um, so I, I do, I did attend that meeting. Yes. Thank you, Cassie. And then I, I guess a follow up question, cause I, I'm really trying to see if I um, kind of understand what's going to be happening in January. So is what's before us, is the, is the idea that when this comes back to us in January, there will be a, a motion of whether we move towards at-large mayor and district elections or is it to create the community outreach kind of process because i i worry and this is also can be a question for rosemary i'm just wondering the staff's role in this because i mean we're moving into the holiday season and i know a lot of council members are probably going to well there might be council members who are going to be leaving i'll be going back to chicago since i didn't get a chance to spend christmas with my family since 2019. i know that's probably similar for a lot of people who have strained in terms of travel and spending time with their families because of COVID. And um, just knowing that people are going to be, you know, really focusing on family and holidays, I think it might be difficult to get the type, the type of engagement that we want. And so um, just really trying to understand timeline and process and also the involvement of city staff, because I know that the city goes dark. Um, I, I do think that the issue of um, staff support is important. We do have uh, a person who's assigned to, uh, Casey Hemart has been assigned <laughs> on the um, district election item. And, you know, she had some continuity with that group that was meet, that was uh, organized in 2018 to look at the governance structure or 2017, whenever it was, I forget. But um, so she had some engagement in that group. Uh, so she's been a, assigned to, to work on that particular issue. Um, but you're right, we've got holiday closure sort of coming up uh, beginning on the 20th, and um, there will be relatively, you know, little going on at the in terms of staff support available during that period of time. But the, I don't know what the, the um, council group that has been working on this is prepared to do and when they're prepared to bring it. So the conversation Donna and I had had a lot to do with that particular timeline. Yeah. And I think council member Cummings, you know, I think we could, I mean, it does say in the staff report, you know, trying to get this something back here, back to us so we can continue to have this conversation by the first meeting in January, but to your, to your comments, you know, maybe it's the second meeting or, or the first meeting in, in February to give ourselves, it's in the staff report, it's not actually in the, or the agenda report, I should say, in the last, very last um, uh, uh, paragraph there. Um, but I think, and Council Member um, Golder, let me know if, I, I, I think our, our intent is to get something second meeting in January or first meeting in February. 
And the reason we would sort of put the pedal on the metal in a sense is that, you know, if we, if, if we do after all the outreach and, and work, if, if we're starting to get what looks to be consensus or at least some, some you know, potential support, we can draft that um, charter amendment and try to put it on the ballot. So we just need to, you know, we won't be able to get there if we don't sort of also acknowledge the, you know, the ballot schedule that we're all forced to look at. So that was kind of the intent with kind of the accelerated timeline, more so than, um, you know, trying to, uh, just trying to get, get some work done that I think, I feel like we sort of missed um, a better timeline for because, um, you know, we just, you know, it, it, it's just where we are. So that's kind of where, but I think we can back that up to your point. And maybe it's the first, first meeting in February or something we shoot for. And then I guess a follow-up question, <clears throat> um, and maybe staff could also help weigh in on this. In terms of getting an item on the, I guess is the intention to have this on the June ballot or the November? Because it seems like if we put this on the November ballot with the district election questions, that would give us a lot of time. You know, yeah. to be uh, if if we don't have to, for example, vote to put a charter amendment on the November ballot until like June, that could provide you know this big window of time when um, the council can that group and you know maybe there's another community group that could really get, do that outreach and get us that information back and uh, have a really clear, transparent process. Um, so. Yeah, I guess the question is, um, you know, it seems like if it's if it's June, it's going to be really tight. If it's November, there's a lot more flexibility, mm -hmm. and I feel like I'd be more comfortable with something with, that come, came that would go on the ballot in June if we move in that direction. But I'd like to hear from staff and then any council comments on that because I just like really for me when this when I first saw this item, the questions that came to mind were, you know, well, who who are we going to do outreach with? It's the holidays, so there might not be staff support. Like. Um, and then, you know, what is the process? And I think we laid that out very clear when it came to the redistricting. We're going to have these meetings on these days and people can weigh in. And without that information, I'm a little, I, I was reserved when I first read this. But through our discussion, I'm becoming a little bit more comfortable, but would like to kind of hear about what kind of flexibility there is and when mm -hmm. items can get placed on ballots. Yeah, I, I think one of the, <clears throat> probably one of the first things that the committee will want to dive into is looking at the timing questions. You know, what is feasible? Um, is there, is it, you know, how feasible would it be to put something on the June primary ballot versus the November ballot? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that will in part guide um, the recommendation that would come back to the city council. And then um, I think there's just a lot of thinking has to go into if the transition to uh, an at-large elected mayor is going to occur, um, that's not the only decision that the council is going to have to confront. It's, you know, what will the mayor's authority be? How long will the term be? Um, you know, and, and all of that will have to be in uh, incorporated into a, a charter amendment that would be placed before the voters. So, so I think the June primary election is a tight timeline, um, and it really depends on, you know, how quickly the, the committee is able to do its work and bring recommendations back to the city council and to the public for, you know, for discussion and debate. Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Um, so just a, a couple of follow-up questions which are, um, have been on my mind for a while and I've sort of just, again, as I said, been kind of going along, going with the flow that's been kind of laid out as the recommended course of action under the circumstances. I wonder, given that um, these are very important questions and I appreciate the um, interest and the, the you know, willingness to put time into um, and trying to, to work through them. And I know that if we have districts in November, at least with respect to, I mean, really with respect to any of these changes that are, are pretty fundamental to the electoral process, um, that would have to be handled prior to November. If we are not going to put seven districts on, for no, or three out of seven out on in November, if we're only going to end up having six districts, right? So th there's the timing question, and I wonder um, 
also given that the the initial attorney has now um, been disbarred in one at least one state, and the <laughs> as far as I can tell, the current um, attorney on the case is um, it, very difficult to reach because there's no public um, uh, information available that is is wor a working phone number, for example. I'm I'm not sure where that attorney is at, and so I just wonder. Um, given that and given the fact that the census was late this year, if there might be a possibility of negotiating um, additional time for <coughs> making the decision around districts. If we want to take this route and we need until November, um, you know, to, to really lay that out, um, what the possibilities might be. Um, and I guess I'm mostly asking my colleagues here if that's something that you would even entertain if it was possible. Um, because I think that this is is really important, and I, I don't want to um, have it be so rushed that we say never mind, we can't do it, and then we just kind of live with what we get, right? So, and I'll look to Cassie or Tony, but um, maybe answer the if you don't mind, Councilmember Brown. Maybe I'll have them weigh on in and on the answer, and then I'll, sure, Vice Mayor Bruner, I saw you. I don't know if it's Cassie or Tony or both of you. Uh, Tony, you want to go? <laughs> I'm looking um, at Cassie. I would say uh, if the council would like us to communicate with the plaintiff's attorney, um, you know, that is something the council could direct our office to do. Um, if we, you know, I, I just feel that, you know, if we just fail to move forward with the district elections along the timeline that we're going on now, we do sort of open ourselves up to a risk of potentially somebody else swooping in and um, making claims against the city. Um, but I would, I wonder if Tony has anything else to add to that. Tony, did you have anything to add to that? Sorry, my computer just died. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think that's, that's right. Um, we will, I guess I would, the only thing I would add is that we've ha not had any problems communicating with the attorney and we have contact information and I don't know what other inquiries have been made, but, um, I, I, I imagine, um, that an attorney in that situation would be leery of talking to members of the public who is called to ask questions. Uh, if I can, I, I understand that. I just, I just wanted to let you know that. We're not not upon my recommendation, members of the public have attempted to reach the attorney and their disconnected phone numbers. So it just, to me, kind of felt like, what are we dealing with another attorney that's not really on top of it? Once again, I just, I don't know. Um, that's not my primary reason for asking this question. The, you know, the I think the primary rationale is the census in data is coming late. We are under the gun for that reason. And um, if we want to make some of the, have this conversation and make some of these other decisions, um, we do need the time. Had we done this sooner, we wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be asking this, but we didn't. And so it's just a question. It's, I'm not trying to disrupt the, the process. I'm not trying to stall the process. I personally would like this to be over sooner <laughs> as soon as possible. But I do feel like it's our responsibility to, um, you know, oversee the process in the most uh, thoughtful and, um, you know, uh, efficacious way that we can. Great. Any other comments or questions from council members? Sorry, sorry, Vice Mayor. That's okay. Um, so my question is, uh, my understanding of um, the proposal to create this city council ad hoc committee is to explore some of this information and um, return the council with direction. And that would include uh, uh, timing, uh, the timing issue that um, Council Member Brown has brought up and I was also actually wondering, I seem to remember um, previously in a discussion with Cassie Bronson, um, when we talked about November 
the reason going to seven uh, districts was simply because there were seven council members and it would not require a charter amendment. But anything else requiring a charter amendment would require a vote. And so the timing does come into question with, we can't wait until November for that possibility, correct? Without an extension of, of the well, um, settlement. So the path that um, the council and the path that the city is on right now is um, our demographer is going to be drawing seven districts. Um, and those, and that is what we'll get in the drawings and that's that's what will be up for the city to consider um, up in you know early 2022. Um, it is possible that uh, the council could approve moving to districts, uh, seven districts, and then at a later time, uh, propose a charter amendment to have this directly elected mayor and also change to six districts. That would require redistricting. Um, we have talked to our consultant and uh, he said that that is possible. And that is something that's not, you know, outside the lens of things that he's done before. So, but it would be, it would be a redistricting that would occur shortly after, you know, our initial districting. Um, we do, I do believe in 2022, we have three council seats uh, that are up for re-election. Uh, and so those could proceed along the, you know, the approved seven district map. Um, and then, you know, it's possible to, uh, would be possible to sort of, you know, make a charter amendment, do a redistricting, and then have an election of the other th three districts. It's, you know, not an ideal situation um, and a little bit complicated, but, you know, this is something we talked about with our demographer and it's possible. Uh, but the path we're going on right now is seven districts. That was my follow-up question, the, the, the idea of a post a charter amendment from November versus pre. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, can you take over the meeting for one minute? Um, I want to talk to somebody in the back of the room. Um, is there any other questions on this at this point? Then I think we could look for a motion. All right, we'll right back. It's about the public. No, public. Public, 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 public. public. Okay, so let's see. Um, for members of the uh, public, if you're interested in commenting on a proposal to create a city ad hoc committee, uh, please line up to my left if you are in person, and I don't see any members of the public in person um, to speak on this. So um, if you are streaming the meeting online, or streaming via community TV, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. So I will go ahead and look out to see if there are any members of the public with their hands raised. this item. I do not see any members of the public with their hands raised. Okay, so give it one more second. All right, so we will take it back to council for deliberation. And I, I'm happy yeah, to council make, member Golder, you had your hand up. I, I'm happy to make a motion. Um, um, create a city council ad hoc committee charged with um, charged to investigate and provide the full council with one discretion whether to establish an at-large directly elected mayor to discretion regarding an establishment of future primary or general election timelines and consideration of ranked choice voting for potential district, council districts and three advise council on other matters related to the city charter as they relate to the implementation of bi-district voting phase 
structure. Okay, so we had a first from council member Golder. Is there oh, wait, I read the, I, did I just read the wrong thing? <laughs> I did, I was, didn't I? I was gonna ask yeah. you uh, to clarify that. I was like, I'm, you know what, I didn't bring my glasses down from either too, so I'm like zooming all the way in. I'm so oh, sorry, guys. The subject. <laughs> I read the subject. Can I also have oh you, council member Golder, if you can also come to the mic. You're very, okay. you're very quiet. Sorry, okay. I don't fit in this big chair. Okay. Um, I'm going to make a motion um, as it's written in the agenda packet. Do I have to read it? You do not. Thank you. And I'll second. <laughs> member. And go ahead. Okay. For, for member future Tom reference, Johnson, um, I'll second. Second. For future reference, you can say I move the recommended action. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Okay. Who was the um, second? I was. Okay. And Bonnie, can we do a roll call? I'm sorry, Council Member Cummings. Yeah, um, I guess I'll just ask again. So the, because I'm really concerned with this as because the way it's written, um, it sounds like that over the break, this group is going to have some community meetings during the holiday season, which could be, has its challenges, and then would be making a recommendation on whether we should have an at-large mayor ranked choice voting and um, primaries at, at, in, at the meeting in January. And um, I'm supportive of you know having these discussions. I think it's really important that we start moving um, into having these discussions with the community. But having a decision brought back early in the year, I, like you know, especially during a time when so many people are likely not going to be available, that's the biggest concern I have right now. And um, I mean, I'd be comfortable with establishing this committee to bring back a process for, you know, having these discussions and outlining, you know, um, the groups that they're, and I don't think that this prevents the group from starting to meet with some community groups, right? Like, if the Democratic Women's Club has reached out and has expressed that they've discussed this and want to meet with the subcommittee, that's fine. You know, if there's other groups that, that can be engaged with, I think that's great. And if that information can come back along with the process, I'd feel more comfortable with that because um, I, I'm just I'm really concerned with the amount of time um, and avail people's availability during the holiday season to have to be you know really truly engaged in this and, and the transparency around the process. So um, I wonder if and I don't know if the, um, the staff's recommendation can be put up on the screen or the sorry the subcommittee recommendation. On the screen, I'm trying to figure out a way um, to, you know, a way that I can feel comfortable with supporting this because, um, for the reasons expressed, I do understand the need to have these discussions. But um, I, I mean, for the, all the things that we've brought up today, I'm just really concerned with having a, uh, a dis, uh, you know, a direction in terms of move forward with at large mayor, you know, at the first meeting in January. In the in the packet, the motion, there's no, nothing about. Yeah, and it would be brought that's forward. Not part of the, it's yeah. not part of the motion. But. It's just really part of the discussion. And I think, you know, I'll go. I, I was looking that way, so I'll go. Um, Councilor Johnson and Brown. Those, um, those are some really valid concerns, and I had the same questions and didn't ask because my colleagues did. And, and what I heard was, um, you, 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 the members of the potential subcommittee heard that, and that we wouldn't be bringing it back at the first meeting in January. We'd extend it out a little bit further. So and I if just wanted to like, clarify. If there's if there's potential, uh, if if we brought something back in January or in, at the first meeting in January, for the process. So here's the groups where we've confirmed outreach to, you know, use of their, for example, um, you know, People's Democratic Club. You know, they were going to hold it. So we can do some work during the holidays, to potentially, you know, identify a set of a set of meeting dates, people who we can outreach to. And we can bring bring you an update if that would work in the first meeting in January, and then you would sort of know sort of the the, the trajectory ahead in terms of all that, and then we sh would shoot basically for, you know, trying to get a lot of that work done. You know, second meeting in January, first meeting in February. Um, if we go to the November ballot, and I think I think that's why I for me I want to try to understand and to Tony's point. 
there, if we want to go to March, we just need to understand what that looks like. So I think that's something that we don't want to jump over as a council. We, I'd like to have that conversation with the council to mm -hmm. say, okay, here's, here's why we would do it, go in March, here's why we would go in June in terms of a chart event before the voters. So I think that's, I, I completely understand your concerns and you know, yeah. never, don't really want to work all over the holidays, but that's kind of, that's kind of as you said, it, it, the timeline is a little bit, it's sort of driven by some of these realities around, around ballot, ballot and stuff. Oh, Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Collins. Yeah. She was after you. Yeah. Okay. So I, I uh, that would be great, um, and, and I think really for us, but also for the public to just have a sense of like, okay, here's what we've done so far. He, you know, we're going to work for the next whatever it is, two weeks or a month, and we are going to meet on these dates, and just so people know what's happening and feel like they have access uh, to the information and to the conversation, um, that would definitely make me feel. Um, you know, more comfortable about the short turnaround. Okay, great. I wonder if I could uh, add Collins a comment Rachel. just briefly. Um, it seems to me like what the council is discussing at this point is really doing the homework to prepare um, a range of options for the public to consider. <laughs> so I, I, I don't think it's envisioned that um, that the committee would be bringing a recommendation to the council to adopt at the first, you know, the first time it's presented. Really, what you need to have in front of you, I think, is what's realistic, what are the options, what are the potential um, good points and bad points associated with each, so that you have enough information to have a meaningful dialogue with members of the public on those issues. Mm -hmm. So the, the outreach, I think, um, is it very important but I think it's premature until you have a better sense of right. what exactly is being proposed. Proposal. Yeah. Thank you for that. Councilmember Collins, Harding. I just wanted to add that we not only rely on the three members of the ad hoc committee that we all do our outreach and, and, and as we do, but just really be intentional and reach out to the community and do this work with you mm -hmm. so that we get as much input as possible in the short amount of time that we have. Great. Any other comments? So I think what we would propose is that I think to Tony's point, you know, it, it would be both, I think Councilmember Cummings sort of, um, you know, looking at these three things, but actually developing a little bit of those, of, of that package. But then, it, you know, at the very first meeting in January, getting some feedback from the council on, along with the list of, of referrals from all of you on how we should do the outreach, but then we, we need to have something to outreach about. You know, we can't have a general conversation about, um, about, uh, for example, the directly elected mayor, you know, does that, you know, what are the duties of that person? You know, so I think we want to have some, a little bit of meat on the bones so that our discussion with the community actually gets a response to some of the options that we'll be analyzing, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> with that being said, I'm wondering if, as a friendly amendment, um, we could add a few points. One would be to um, um, return with a process and timeline for community engagement. Okay. And then the other would be to add, in addition to what's on there, um, the reestablishment of the Charter Review Committee. And I bring that up, that last point up, because if it seems like you know there's going to be a lot of time to, you know, if it if it seems like these conversations are going to be much more lengthy, and um, you know, it might be in our in our interest to reestablish the citizens charter review committee so that you know if this is going to be a longer timeline than we anticipate, and you know people in the community um, have expressed you know uh, they would like us to you know, go beyond the timeline for the district elections and have this be a longer conversation, it might be worth, rather than this becoming a political issue, the community plays a large role in, and, and we establish a, uh, a charter review committee, re or reestablish a charter review committee. Because there's a, a number of, when that body was together, these topics were all on there, but there were a number of other topics. And, you know, it might be that 
if we want to move towards, um, you know, addressing everything related to the charter review, uh, that we have a citizens group that goes out and does that. So it's just, you know, putting an option on there as well for that to happen. I, uh, first, I want to see where the... I, so I'm not familiar with the charter review amendment committee, so I'm just trying to look, I'm looking on the city's website right now, trying to see what it was and if someone wants to tell me more about it, and maybe I could read it while you guys are asking your questions. I'm happy to explain it to you. Okay. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure, exactly sure what year it was established. I know it was before I was on the council, but there was a committee that was established, I think when David Tarazas was mayor, and actually, Sandy, you might be able to speak to it because you were actually on the council at this time, so maybe it would actually be better for you. Uh, sure. Uh, so we established a charter review committee to... Um, that was comprised of members of the community. Um, each council member nominated someone, and then we had a few additional um, at-large positions. They began to meet. Casey Hemard actually was the staff person for that and she, doing a great job, and they began to gather information about these different um, possibilities. Rank choice, a directly elected at-large mayor were included. Um, there... It included other considerations such as um, the number of city council seats, um, pay, the, the, the pay for uh, doing this job, and a few other, a few other items. Um, proportional representation was also discussed, and um, there's a um, small group of people in the community who are really interested in us exploring that um, possibility as well. So they were all kind of in the mix. The committee began to meet and um, it was um, uh, for a variety of reasons shuttered and it with I my an expectation was that it would be revisited and that didn't happen and um, our previous city manager um, pretty much said no that's not happening. So we, you know, f there's for fiscal reasons that, that that was not something that the city wanted to consider. And that was given to the grant, that was as part of the grand jury report. So we sort of got set up to just say, no, we're done. We're not doing, we're not continuing down this road. But I thought that they were generating some really um, productive conversation. There was a lot of disagreement. There was a lot of like strong opinions and they were working together to try to find a way forward to have that conversation and bring us, um, the council, a package of um, perhaps not unifying recommendations, but options. So we did not get the benefit of more thorough deep dive into the possibilities and what the implications would be and, and looking at other jurisdictions. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, so that it was a process that I think had a lot of potential. It did, um, it, it was a significant um, project for the city. Mm -hmm. And um, I, if we really, I mean, I would love to see that um, happen. <laughs> um, realistically, I understand under the timelines that we've got, it's difficult to think about, but I think, um, and I want, this is, I wanted to ask um, Council Member Cummings, um, you're talking when you say reestablish. I believe you're talking about consideration of reestablishing the I charter amendment. Yeah, because these are all it's, yeah. right. Um, because evaluate if yeah, if you, if you in your org, if it feels like wow, there's a lot more that we need to do here, that maybe that's something you might include as a recommendation to us, or at least consider, you know, uh, you know, an alternative way forward or a, a longer. Uh, term process if it seems like that would be perfect. thank you that totally helped me understand and I was looking it over and I saw they had just only a couple meetings it looks like and yeah. so I'm not sure why it, why it ended but I think consider if you put consider reestablishing re re a charter amendment committee I think yeah that sounds totally reasonable to me is that your intent yeah and I was gonna say the the intent of this was that you know since it says that the subcommittee will be charged with exploring and returning to council their recommendations that's kind of what it's under, their recommendations on transitioning, their recommendations on um, reestablishing the Charter Amendment Committee. So it's just, you know, in addition to the recommendations that you all would bring around, you know, mayor, um, ranked choice voting, all these, that that be included because it seems like that's just another approach to, deal, to addressing these issues is whether we should have a citizens committee kind of lead this charge 
and um, really make it so that it's not a political issue, that it's really, you know, citizen driven. They're coming to us. There's been a bunch of outreach. So it's just a, a way of trying to um, provide another, you know, option for moving down this path. Great. Looks like the maker of the motion is okay with it, and the seconder is too. Did you have a comment, Vice Mayor? That was exactly my, my comment, was the, it said reestablish the Charter Amendment Committee, but I was curious if that meant know, return with some mm -hmm. recommendation whether or not that should be reestablished. It sounds like that charter review committee information specific to this topic might be helpful context for this ad hoc committee. Um, so I'm sure um, after exploring this topic, um, those, those considerations will be brought forward. Thank if you. I could just Thank you. jump in briefly. Sure. <clears throat> I was involved with the Charter Review Committee, and I think they met twice. And I, and I want to say it was in the August and September of 2018. Um, November 1st, November 29th. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, in any event, um, I saved all that information that was reviewed, and we'll ha be happy to discuss that with the committee and right. so that you can evaluate um, you know, whether or not to bring a recommendation back to reestablish something like that. Okay. Thank you. Yes. If, I, if I could just put in one plea, this I'm not going to ask that it be um, formalized in a friendly amendment, but um, it, we've received communications from uh, a group that is interested in pursuing or, or looking at evaluative proportional representation. It's a model that's used in mostly in Europe. We it's very um, you know, different from the way that we do <laughs> do our elect elections. Um, but I think it's really interesting, and I think that there's some out things about it that might just kind of generate some, some uh, you know, just more expansive conversation about how, what we can do um, to engage uh, um, our community in the electoral process and ensure that votes aren't diluted. I mean, that's really what this has driven this, right, is um, dilution of, of um, the vote. And um, you know who, you know, lack of representation by certain um, interest groups, protected classes. So I'm just going to put in a plea to um, take that call from uh, from the folks who are interested in talking with you about evaluative proportional representation, and um, you know, hearing more about it. Great, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Can I just get clarification? Yes. For accuracy. Is it the Charter Amendment Committee or Charter Review Committee? It's been Charter Review. Charter Review. Charter I review. think it was called Charter yeah. Review. That's probably right. Yep. Okay. Can we do a roll call vote, Bonnie? Did you call for public comment yet? I did yet? put it up for public comment. Oh, no. It's, uh, Sonia brought out the public comment. Sonia. Yeah. yeah. Sonia. All yeah. oh, right. Okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Council member Watkins is absent. Valentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, we have a little decision making here to do. <laughs> we are an hour and 10 minutes ahead of time. Um, and we, next we have the updated water rate structure and establishing the revised drought cost recovery fees to implement, to be implemented in response to a council declared water shortage emergency. Rosemary, is this noticed at this time or could we move into this item and then it's basically noticed finish for after 10 a.m. this morning, so we're good. So question for council is, do you wanna take a long break and then come back or would you like to keep moving? We have one other item behind this, which is the election of our mayor and our vice mayor. And um, and, and then we have oral comments. So we could breeze through this and get out early this evening. Does that sound okay? Okay, so maybe a five minute bio break. <laughs> okay. I was just, gee, don't you want to prolong your yeah, I really want circus? To, I really want to. <laughs> 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 okay. It's like I want to. I'm gonna get on one of those backboards that put you back the other way. Okay, um, just a quick um, remind, just for council members, because we're learning how to do this. Um, 
when we leave or when we're in this room, our mics are still live all the time now, okay. rather than getting turned off. So uh, just to, just this is just like a testing. They're testing the mics, so if we have another hybrid meeting, it would that wouldn't be the case. Oh, okay. so just today. Oh, it's just for now. Okay, but is the public hearing us right now? Yeah. There was somebody that texted though they were having trouble hearing. Yeah, but then they and it's like I, the sound went off, and they said it, they it sent it twice. People just aren't speaking loud enough. I think uh, it's a, I think it's a Zoom to Zoom issue. Uh, um, okay. Not they're they're okay hearing us. Got it. Got it for the most part. Okay, we will reconvene <clears throat> and move on to item number. Uh, 20. 20. Where's my... I believe this one. I must two pages go under my computer. Okay. Next up on the agenda is item number 20, adopt a resolution establishing an updated water rate structure and establishing revised drought cost recovery fees to be implemented in response to a council declared water shortage emergency. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wanna comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. If you, so I'll go ahead and we are going to have a very short presentation by our interim city manager who um, was, is also our water director um, on this item. And then we will uh, go ahead and have questions from council and then we will take it out to the public. And uh, my understanding is this is actually a formal public hearing, right, for this. So um, guide me as needed, Rosemary, with regards to that in terms of um, how people, you know, need to how much time on the public hearing. Okay. Turn it over to, to Rosemary Menard. Okay, great, thank you very much. I'm going to just give you a very brief um, couple of introductory comments, and then I'm gonna introduce, um, I'm gonna introduce Nancy Fan, who is our consultant from Raftelis Consultants, and she's going to go through a brief presentation that is has a lot of slides in it, but one of the reasons I'm showing this particular document, this is our uh, public notice for the Prop 218 um, hearing required. And this document actually had something like eight pages in it, and it includes um, a number of, you know, quite a bit of information about how we did the rates, and then tables that you'll see familiar um, from the presentation you're about to see that has all of the rate proposals in them. So the details of a lot of the slides that Nancy's going to show in her presentation very briefly are, have been out there in the community since early October. And the process for today is a, um, is a, is a public hearing, it's a required public hearing to, for the council to receive comments on the rates and to um, acknowledge the receipt of any protest receives. If the protest receives are 50% of the total accounts plus one, uh, which would be a number over 12,000 in our case, then uh, the council is not uh, authorized to proceed with the proposed rates. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy and allow her to um, share her screen. She's uh, a panelist, so I think you should be able to see her momentarily and have her share her screen and run through this presentation with you. Take it away, Nancy. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Can everyone see my screen and hear me clearly? Yes, we yes. can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so good evening, City Council and members of the public, uh, and thank you, Rosemary, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Nancy Van, and I'll be guiding us through the presentation today, uh, which starts with a little primer on the rate study process, and then we'll dig into the numbers. So that means the financial impact, the proposed water rates, and then the impact of these changes to the city's customers. So the rate study process kicked off early last year and reviews how the city charges for water service. The water utilities typically conduct rate studies as an industry best practice to maintain the utility's financial health today and also to determine the best path forward to meet financial obligations in the future. So rate studies are often performed about every five years or so. So the city's water rate study that we're reviewing today looks at past, present, and future. So what the costs have been to provide water service, 
what the water department's financial position is today and what needs to be accomplished in the future and how much that's expected to cost. So the rate structure not only addresses what the city needs to provide to provide a safe and reliable water service, but how it can recover those costs by looking at the rate structure itself. Uh, the city's water rate study followed these four major steps that are outlined on this slide. So the rate setting framework determines what the city wants to achieve from a financial and policy perspective. Uh, the cost of service and rate design process determines how to fairly distribute those costs between your customers. The financial plan review determines how much rate revenue the city needs to meet objectives. And finally, the rate adoption process involves the final report and proposed rates and the public hearing that we're all at today. Okay. Successful rate studies are those that um, meaningfully engage the public and result in rates that, that meet the needs of not only the utility, but also the customers and the community that it serves. So engaging the public throughout this process has been very critical and was made possible by the integrated efforts of the City Council, the Water Commission, customer panels, and Water Department staff throughout this process. So since the start of the, last, the study last February, we discussed key issues and took direction at nine Water Commission meetings uh, and two City Council meetings. We shared information through City Communication Channels and hosted eight customer panels to glean what matters most to the city's customers. And then more recently, property owners were notified of the proposed changes in the mailed notice that Rosemary just showed on the screen earlier. And today we have the public hearing to consider formally adopting the new rate structure and rates as a result of this process. So one of the first things that we did in the study was to seek guidance from the city council and the water commission to determine the values-based policies and objectives that would guide the study. Uh, the Council and Commission established the following goals that served kind of as our study North Star, and those include uh, ensuring that water is affordable for essential use, uh, ensuring that we maintain transparency and equity for capital and water reliability needs, and providing sufficient revenues to meet operating capital and customer service level needs. So once we determined the overarching policy objectives that would guide the process, we then looked at what the desired outcomes would be. So that led us to look at changes to the water rate structure, which is how the, how the city charges for water service. So these changes are designed to make it simpler for the city's customers to understand what goes into their monthly water bill, um, allow customers to easily manage their water use, to better align rates that customers pay with costs to serve them based on the most recent available data and to ensure that water for essential indoor use maintains, is, remains affordable for everyone in the community. Okay, so once we've determined the goals and objectives of the rate study, we then move on to the financial impact. So the, the rate study assumes uh, water use of approximately 2.4 billion gallons per year which is based on usage from fiscal year 2019. And so the reason that we use the historical year to estimate ongoing water consumption is to avoid capturing the shorter term impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic for the entire study period. Uh, the revenue needs consist of three different components. So we have the, the O&M or operating component, which funds the operating costs of the water utility, uh, the capital slash infrastructure reinvestment or ERF, component, uh, which funds capital project costs and debt service, and then the rate stabilization fee, which is used to fund the rate stabilization reserve. Okay. So if the city did not raise water rates, we estimated that the water department collects approximately $39.3 million under the previous consumption of 2.4 billion gallons of water use per year. Um, the proposed financial plan resulted in revenue needs of $42 million, and I'll use my cursor to circle that right there, um, for the first year, which is a 6.9% increase in rate revenue. So just keep in mind that these revenues don't include the rate stabilization fee, which I'll go over in a little bit, or those from the proposed drought cost recovery fees that will be discussed later on in this presentation. So after outlining the total revenue needs to fund operating and capital costs over the next five years, we then smooth out the rate revenues in the latter four years 
uh, to avoid kind of major rate spikes throughout the study period. So the revenue needs determine how much rate revenue the city requires, whereas the proposed rate structure changes impact impacts how the city recovers those costs within its rate structure. So with any rate study, there will be inevitably there will inevitably be shifts in the rate structure simply by nature of conducting a rate study. Um, a utility and its costs change over time, and so does its rate. However, there are a couple of modifications to the rate structure which help the city meet its defined objectives, as mentioned in the prior slide. The first, the inside outside city surcharge will be eliminated, which simplifies the rate structure and reduces administrative burden to city staff. Since the outside city surcharge represented only a small portion of the city's annual rate revenue, the cost impact of this change is pretty, mar pretty marginal. Um, the elevation surcharge, which is only charged to customers that live at higher elevation zones, um, will be expanded from one zone to three different zones, which more accurately cap captures the cost of pumping water to the highest um, the fire readiness to serve charge will be updated to allocate costs appropriately based on the capacity in the water system needed to provide firefighting services. And the North Coast agriculture rates will now include two different options, which is maintain reliability and decrease reliability. Um, and this is to address the water reliability challenges that the city is facing for these customers. And finally, the residential tiers will shift from four tiers to three tiers uh, to better align with the most recent usage characteristics and to simplify the rate structure. Uh, California's Proposition 218 uh, requires a nexus between the rates that customers are charged and the cost to serve those customers. And so that also necess necessitates the clear rationale for the, the tier definitions that we see. So the proposed residential tiers use, um, tier one uses average winter use or five CCF of water. Um, this represents average indoor or essential water use since irrigation in the winter months is pretty minimal. Um, the proposed tier two, which is based on average summer use uh, and goes up to six CCF or nine CCF per month. Um, that is a that's a proxy for outdoor water use and irrigation use is highest in the summer months. So the proposed changes keep tier one at five CCF, um, tier two changes to nine CCF per residential unit per month. And then tier three is any usage 10 CCF or greater. Okay, so I'll move through the slides for the proposed water rates pretty quickly uh, since this information is all available through the mail of Prop 218 notice as well as the city's website. Uh, the readiness to serve charge, uh, this mostly recovers costs associated with customer service, billing, and meter maintenance. The fire readiness to serve charge mostly recovers costs associated with meter maintenance and fire capacity. The consumption charges are based on per CCF of water use and recovers the remaining operating costs of the utility. The infrastructure reinvestment fee is based on CCF of water and recovers the capital and debt service costs of the utility. The elevation surcharge, which is based on CCF of water use, recovers the cost of pumping water to the higher elevation zone. And then the rate stabilization fee will stay at $1 per CCF based on city policy, which is used to fund the rate stabilization reserve. So since the city's rate structure is mostly dependent on consumption-based revenue, uh, which allows the city's customers to have greater control over their water bills, but also can create revenue instability when customers use less water than projected. So funding this reserve helps the city mitigate the financial risk of revenue instability due to this rate structure. So this graph shows the estimated impact to a residential customer bill each month. So a customer with a five-eighth five inch meter uh, uses, using about four CCF of water per month will see less than a $2 increase in their monthly water bill. 
Then when comparing the city of Santa Cruz with neighboring or similar water utilities, the city's single family residential bills are on the lower to medium range of the various utilities that we see here. And this is for a five H five H and meter with a six PCF of water use per month. Okay, and this shows the sample residential bills for the five year rate schedule for a residential customer with a five eighth inch meter using four CCF of water per month. Okay, and then we'll move on to the proposed drought rates or drought cost recovery fees. So these rates are designed to coincide with the specific drought stages, which were defined by the city's water shortage contingency plan. These rates are meant to recover lost revenue due to reduced consumption during drought. Um, since the water's rate structure, city's water rate structure is largely dependent on consumption-based revenue, um, but the city's costs are mostly fixed and don't vary with water consumption. The proposed drought rates are um, a fixed charge based on meter size to ensure that the city can recover sufficient revenues during periods of drought. Okay. There are five different drought stages. Stage one is a 10% overall reduction in use. Stage two is 20% and so on and so forth. So in the instance that the city council formally just declares a drought stage, uh, the drought rates corresponding with that drought stage can be implemented to maintain the utility's financial stability and allows the city to continue to provide reliable water service. Uh, the drought rates follow the same five-year implementation structure as the water rates, which are adjusted in the latter years based on the revenue adjustments required in the financial plan. Uh, the Prop 218 notice shows the entire five-year schedule for all different drought stages that will show uh, just the drought cost recovery fees for stage two, which is shown here. So this graph shows the impact for a residential customer with a five eighth, five eighth inch meter using six PCF of water per month. So we can see that um, at the baseline with no drought, uh, a customer will pay about $75 per month using that much water. And then in stage two with a 20% reduction um, with the drought cost recovery fee, which is in gray right there, Applied to it, they'll be paying approximately $80. I think that is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so now that um, the next step is if there are questions or um, then we can take the questions and then beyond that, you can open the public hearing and if you have anyone who'd like to comment. Okay, is there any questions from council members? Council member Golder? Councilmember Cummings. All right. Um, I'm wondering if you could go back to slide 25 just for a quick second, and I just wanted to catch that. Okay. Um, so right now, our, what, what stage drought would we be in right now? What the, the council declared stage one um, drought cost recovery fee or drought stage in uh, April last year, and the the declaration really expired at the end of um, at the end of October. We did not actually implement a drought cost recovery fee structure in this last round, partly because uh, we were in between rate studies and the last uh, study didn't really bring in very much water or very much money because it was set at a much lower level, but also because we kind of made a decision that we would use the uh, rate stabilization reserve uh, to mitigate whatever impacts we en ended up having this summer on the, rather than trying to impose the drought cost recovery fee. The drought cost recovery fee has really been retained from the existing structure because our, our rates are so heavily dependent. Um, and honestly, I would really not like to put it in place, but if we got to a stage three or a stage four, our rates would be so impacted by people cutting back, our, our revenues would be so impacted by people cutting back. The drought, uh, the rate stabilization, 
I'm sorry, the rate stabilization reserve probably wouldn't be enough to keep us whole. So it's kind of, uh, it's linked to a council declaration for a specific stage. If it's implemented, it's not required to be implemented, but if the, we go ahead and do implement it, it goes 12 months, spreads out over 12 months, and then it automatically stops unless the council re-ups another stage. Rosemary, can you give us an example, an example of like what rainfall would have to be, or, or maybe a past year where you've had to get at like to four or five? Like, what would that look look like? That seems so extreme. To me. Oh gosh, yeah, that would be pretty bad. It would be like having a, a summer of twenty one, probably in the summer of twenty two and the summer of twenty three. So it would be the same kind of very dry year we had last year, about three years in a row recognizing that what we had done to get through the first year would draw down our reservoirs to some degree. So it would, be, it, would be, it would be really horrible. It's one of the reasons why the big focus is supply development, because if we're vulnerable in that way, it would have negative consequences sort of across the economy of the whole um, service area. Thank you guys very much. Council Member Cummings, did you have a question? I just had a clarifying question. <clears throat> um, so when these rates kick in, it's really to help cover because if people are cutting back, they're not using, they're not consuming as much water, they're not going to be paying for that. And these fees are really to help continue to keep our operations moving in these times during drought with the understanding that at some point, we're going to have more rain. People will consume more water. Those rates will go down. Is that a, a so you're talking about drought cost recovery fees? Yes, those are very specifically related to having us be able to maintain operations and pay our debt service, right? The because we borrowed money for capital projects and we're continuing to do that, but we need to be able to cover our debt service in particular. So if you were to take 30% of our revenue and say we didn't get that that this year because of you know having a 30% cutback, then we you know we would be at risk of not being able to meet our debt service and certainly to operate our our operations. As Nancy said, the water department is a really high fixed cost uh, entity. About eight percent of its total costs are variable, and those are mostly power and chemicals, whereas you know, if we produce uh, 10 million gallons today or 7 million gallons today, the amount of our cost doesn't vary very much because it's mostly in fixed costs. And then again, just for clarification, anytime we go into those stages, that decision comes to the council for approval. Absolutely, and and we would um, articulate that. And in in cases like a stage one in particular, even though it would be authorized for us to go ahead and put the drought cost recovery fees on, we might not do it because we would be able to say, you know, we would be able to absorb that. That's one of the benefits of maintaining the rate stabilization reserve. It gives us some flexibility. Um, so it's kind of a, uh, and I think we would obviously tell you what we're planning to do, but in general, like in the stage one that we did in 2018, and the stage one we did this year, we did not impose the drought cost recovery fees, even though we could have. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, not seeing any other hands up. Um, I'll go ahead and take this out to the public. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, we're on now on item number 20. If this is an item you wanna comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. We will go ahead and ask you to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And then when it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted and then we'll set the timer for two minutes. So again, if you're in the audience tonight and you wanna comment on item number 20, now is the time to raise your hand so I can see who's out there in terms of um, wanting to comment on this item. Okay, um, phone number ending in 6241, that's our first person. So go ahead and press star six to unmute and you'll be ready to go. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Linda Wilshusen and I live in Live Oak. Uh, I'd like to thank the Santa Cruz City Council, the interim city manager, Rosemary Menard and the city attorney 
for the council's action earlier this year to permanently eliminate the surcharge on water rates by customers living outside the city limits. This action, which is an important aspect of today's water rates recommendation, will ensure that ratepayers throughout the city's water service area are billed in an equitable manner consistent with the city's policies and with state law. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Next I have um, phone number ending in 1810. Yeah, I don't have too much to say about this, but I guess I don't really understand when you say, you know, that we have a drought and we, we you set goals of 10% or 20% reduction in water, but that doesn't mean that people won't use more than that or, you know, or less or whatever. So if they were to use more and you had a windfall of money, uh, is there any provision for carrying that over and not, you know, bilking everyone the next year, uh, anything like that? That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Is anyone else in the audience today for item number 20? If you are, uh, if you could please raise your hand by pressing star nine. <coughs> Get a sense of who's out there. Okay. Um, then we'll go ahead and bring this back to council um, for deliberation. So. And, uh, at okay. this point, um, we have received some protests, and I'm going to ask um, the clerk to tell us they, they come in and go to her offices. And so. Yeah, we've received um, 36. 36 protests. Protests. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the measure is 50% plus one, which, as I mentioned earlier, would be around 12,000. To reach that 50% plus, percent plus one. Okay. I think yeah. we got there. Um, so, uh, at this point, the council is uh, able to move towards uh, um, the motions that are here, and there are two. One is to actually adopt the rate increases that are laid out, and the other one is to adopt, uh, accept the uh, cost of service analysis, which was included in the packet. It's an important document. It's an administrative record of well, how we did what we did in combination with the uh, a long-range financial plan that the council adopted in September. It's the two pieces of the puzzle that uh, brings forward the information that underlies the rate study work and the compliance with Prop 218, but also setting, setting out the long-range goals of what we need to uh, generate in terms of revenue and the reasons behind that. Right. Is there a motion, or is there a council member to, ready to bring a motion forward or these two options? Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, yeah, I, I will go ahead and move the staff recommendation uh, to adopt the resolution establishing an updated water rate structure and to accept the cost of service report as written in our agenda packet. Um, I just want to make a, well, actually, I'll, I'll make the motion. Let, wait for a second. I, have, I do have one comment. I'll wait. Okay. Vice Mayor Bruner. I will second that motion. Okay. Councilmember Brown. Okay, so I just, I do want to make a comment about, um, first of all, thank the water director and the staff and our uh, consultants for this incredible amount of, of work that's gone into bringing us this proposal. Um, it's, it doesn't, um, I mean, there's certain things that we can't do and we've had, we've received comments and I've uh, over the years lamented, and I'm just going to do it one more time, the fact that um, Prop 218 makes it uh, very difficult for, or if impossible really, for us to uh, do any kind of rate structure that addresses the financial um, situation of our customers. And so low and fixed income people um, are adversely affected in ways that m m most don't experience from these um, incremental changes. and. So um, I, I just wanted to say that. I know that other folks have been writing in and, and talking about that, and um, I wish there was more we could do. But I also wanted to just reference that I, in a conversation that I had with our water director um, and interim city manager, it sounds like there may be some possibilities. And um, again, I want to thank you for being on top of the, you know, those possibilities and that we may be in a position to get um, 
so, into a pilot program or some sort that, you know, there, there are things that may be coming. I don't want to raise hopes, but I do want to say that to the extent that we, any and all possible um, avenues for us to address that challenge, I think we are pursuing, and I'm confident that our staff is doing that. So um, I just wanted to say that before we take the vote. This is, um, you know, obviously over time this is going to um, have an impact, and it's also going to um, keep our water system <laughs> operating, and that's what is the most important thing. Yeah, thanks for that. I, that we, you and I talked about it, and I um, did mean to mention that, and I forgot, but um, so the affordability issue is clearly one that is, you know, just totally in the front of me as we try to make this major investment, and I guess I'll just say uh, <coughs> three things maybe briefly. One is there, there uh, is ongoing interest at the state level. There certainly is a rearage money that's coming through right now to help deal with people who weren't able to pay their utility bills during the COVID situation, at least the water part of their utility bills. So that part is definitely something we're working on taking advantage of. The, the uh, federal infrastructure package that was signed into law last week includes funding for EPA to uh, establish, I think, 30 to 40 pilot projects to look at water affordability. And I think because of the work we've already done on assessing water affordability in our community and something that we shared, I've shared with you both in uh, you know, a separate session a while ago and then more recently, I think, as part of the little bit of the update that we did on the, um, on the financial plan and the in the time frame in September, uh, we have a benchmark and I have asked the person who's done the work for us on that particular analysis to update that looking forward to the end of this five year rate period, which as you can see from that one slide does include a, you know, a significant increase for people using not that much water uh, in what their costs would be. Those costs are mostly being driven by capital and that's the other piece of this, which is being in a position to find ourselves resources from any kind of grants or, uh, you know, those kinds of funds either at the state or the federal level, of which there are a lot right now, does will benefit ratepayers in this community, and our those things are aggressively being pursued. And should we find ourselves in a situation where we get a huge chunk of money for a capital project, particularly as a grant, we will definitely be making adjustments to these rates so that they're they're sort of phased in more slowly or or you know adjusted as needed because what's driving the, these rates over time is the reinvestment in the capital that is so important for a water system that's already experiencing climate, the effects of climate change. And Rosemary, would those um, adjustments also? I, I've, I've gotten a couple of comments from the business community, so I'm assuming those are not only that those those kinds of things are evaluated across all of our service Absolutely. areas for all types of yeah. all types of users. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor by um, Councilmember Brown, seconded by Vice Mayor Bruner, and Bonnie. I would call for a roll call vote. Councilmember Watkins is absent. By uh, Calentari Johnson, aye. Brown, aye. Cummings, aye. Golder, aye. Vice Mayor Bruner, aye. Mayor Myers, aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you um, to the whole water department. I know this has been a, and the water commission. I know this has been a heavy lift for your department for several years. So congratulations getting a lot done on the water department side, that's for sure, so thanks. And just to confirm it, passed. Um, Unanimously. With, uh, Council Member Watkins absent. With Council Member Watkins absent, sorry. Okay, next up is agenda item number 21, which is our election of our new mayor and vice mayor for 2022. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Um, so we are, the process we'll do here is um, we will go ahead and I'm looking to Bonnie. Um, do we do vice mayor first or mayor first? Uh, we did vice mayor last year first, but it's up to you. Okay. 
why don't we go ahead and do uh, vice mayor first um, and should and we'll do the nominations and then we'll go to public comment and then we'll take a vote correct um, probably public comment first and then the nomination. First, okay, we'll do that. Okay, that's what I thought. That seemed. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and take this out to public comment. This is uh, our item number 21 tonight. It's election of the new mayor and vice mayor for 2022. If you are streaming this meeting, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and we'll set the timer for two minutes. And we don't have any, just for the public, there are no members of the public in the chamber, so we're gonna go straight to Zoom. And if you wanna, uh, if you wanna comment on this item, you'll need to please raise your hand at this point. I'm not seeing any raised hands, so I'll go ahead and take it back to my colleagues. And I would look for a nomination for the new vice mayor for 2022. I'd like to nominate Martine Watkins for vice mayor for 2022. Great. And a second? I'll second that. Okay. Second by Golder. So we have nomination for to nominate council member Martine Watkins to be our vice mayor for the 2022 term, seconded by council member Golder. And could we do a roll call, please? Council member Watkins is absent. <laughs> um Tari Johnson. Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That, most, that nomination passes unanimously with Council Member Watkins uh, absent. <laughs> She's You're on for all the committee. Congratulations. <laughs> right. You can decide to get back on the plane or not. <laughs> I assume she knows she's going to be nominated, right? Yes, she did. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to look now for a nomination for mayor from my colleagues. I'd like to nominate. Oh, I'd like to nominate Vice Mayor uh, Bruner for mayor. Second. And a second by Council Member Cummings. So we have a nomination to um, uh, nominate uh, Sonia Bruner as our new mayor for the 2022 term, and that is a motion by Council Member Golder and a second by Council Member Cummings. And can we do a roll call vote? Council Member Watkins is absent. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. <sighs> and uh, we uh, have uh, Council Member Watkins as um, absent on that. So congratulations, new Mayor Bruner. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And just for members of the public, um, the mayor and the vice mayor are actually sat, is that the word, seated? I think it's seated um, into their new roles on December 14th. So please come on out and celebrate our new leadership in the city and uh, wish them well in, uh, for 2022. Um, our last item tonight is oral communications. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed to, on today's agenda. Are there any members of the public who wish to address the council? I see that we have one hand up, and that is a phone number ending in 1810, and you can unmute and you have two minutes to speak. Yeah, this is Mr. Phillips. I was gonna bring out the verbal flamethrower over the left slandering everyone whom they politically disagree with as a racist white supremacist, but instead I'll just revisit your white supremacist resolution item number 28 last meeting. One essence of the Brown Act is to require providing agenda items, content to the council and public in advance. A secretly prepared friendly resolution amendment, as usual, blindsided the council and public with surprise novel actions, sidestepping the public entirely after public comment was over, which then put council members on the spot with little considered analysis. It's unlike other items with two hearings. 
I had I, the chance, I would have spoken about how wrong it is for legislative bodies to promote activism, to expand upon novel restorative justice ideas because, A, you never even define restorative justice anywhere except suggesting it's whatever the Santa Cruz Equity Collaborative says it is that you blindly agree to promote, and B, because criminal justice is mostly fully occupied by state law, and C, okay, I don't trust effective equity concepts defining restorative or less, less leftist justice anything. Besides the press associating them with the BLM billboard, the Santa Cruz Equity Collaborative is mysterious to me. My opinion is the foundation of the leftist equity falsehood is the concept that a human's potential is some knowable certainty, and also that a central picture ID'd a quadruplet of SEEQ people very inappropriately dressed in black t-shirts reading end white supremacy at a pretrial criminal court hearing, which made for a bad prejudice rad radical political optic suggesting they are leftist activists and not qualified parties who redesign justice anything. Abby Mustafa's Kiss My Black Arts t-shirt also conveys this grandstanding activism, as does the BLM billboard itself. I speculate their idea of restorative justice may be a mob, coercive, political, grandstanding, public shaming. I question your judgment, specifying just them for special access and blowing city dollars, directing staff to engage with them for an undefined purpose. Uh, which, uh, well, uh, for purposes of which I'm Thank you. Your time's up. Okay, that brings us to the end of our meeting this evening. I just want to thank everybody that joined us on Zoom. Uh, not many people in the chambers, but uh, that's okay. And wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. And our next meeting will be on November 30th at 4 p.m. So thank you, everybody in the public, and have a happy holiday. Good night. And our mic's still on. Are we live? Are we still live, Bonnie? <laughs> Wait, so.